Environments in society, the role of leaders in creating the right environment. Hello, I'm Andy Hodges. I will be co-moderating this discussion this afternoon with the Chief Operating Officer of World Maker International, David Richmond. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network, ZTN, and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services, PVO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. This broadcast is streaming live on Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network. So should you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please post them on our Facebook page and we'll endeavor to get our panelists to answer them. Um, now, to give us our opening and welcome remarks is an individual who is known to most people on the African continent and worldwide. It is no exaggeration to say that she is an inspiration to both young and old throughout the continent. Kirsty Lay Coventry is Zimbabwe's Minister of Youth, Sport, Arts and Recreation. She is a former Olympic swimmer and world record holder and the most decorated Olympian from Africa with seven Olympic medals. She was a member of the International Olympic Committee, IOC, and in early 2018 was elected the chairperson of the IOC Athletes Commission, the body that represents Olympic athletes worldwide. So I hand over to Kirsty Coventry for introduction. Minister. Hello, everybody. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you may be joining us from. Thank you very much, Andy, for uh, that very nice intro. Um, I'm extremely honored to be a part of today's discussions and I uh, would just like to thank uh, everybody for, for their involvement and, and their support in, in all the different manners. Um, it is a very um, noble uh, virtual meeting that we're having and virtual discussion as well as um, very good in terms of the way and where we see the world today. Um, I think there's nothing uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, correct than talking about mental health and resilience and, and how we can all move forward. So I was asked to share with you some stories, some personal stories um, from when I was uh, training and um, competing and um, there was really one instance and one story that really stuck out in in my mind where it took a lot of mental strength um, and resilience to look at the situation in a positive way um, and to try and get a positive outcome um, I'll give you a, a little bit of a brief background for those that don't know me. Um, I have competed in five Olympic Games, and um, I'm not going to be talking about the two games where I won my medals. I'm actually going to be talking about the Olympic Games that were held in London in 2012. Um, leading up to the Olympic Games in London, I um, was right on track. Um, I had been training for the three, four years leading up to it. Uh, generally, after Olympic Games, you may take a few months break, but then you get right back into the swing of things. And that London for me was no difference. Um, I had left Beijing with three silver medals and a gold. And I wanted London to be my... Um, my final song um, and I wanted to go out with a bang and I wanted to try and do something that not many athletes in the swimming world have been able to do and that's um, win three Olympic gold medals in one event, uh, that being the 200 meter backstroke. And so that was my main goal. And um, I, like I said, I had been training really well, everything seemed on track. And then it was about four months um, before the London Games. And um, I had had a really good workout. It was towards the end of the week. I was finishing up my training in the weight room. And uh, I was actually warming down. And my coach, Kim Bracken, was training with me on that day. And um, we are very competitive. And she challenged me to uh, one of our last sprints. We were doing some running, some short running bursts um, of, of sprints, 75 uh, sort of meters. So it was in a, 
um, a, a weight room where we would run 25 meters and we would sprint and then turn around, sprint back. And she challenged me that, um, you know, she, she could beat me. And so being the competitive person, I, I tried my hardest to not let that happen. And unfortunately, as I turned to come back um, on that last burst of uh, 25 on the AstroTurf, I dislocated my knee and my kneecap was sitting behind my, my leg. Um, it was very painful. And as an athlete, all you can think of is what does this mean? How bad is this injury? What does it mean for my career? Am I going to make it to the Olympics? Where to? And um, I remember my gym coach and Kim, my, my swimming coach, both trying to hide, you know, sort of stand in between. I'm lying on the floor and stand in between my sight and, and my knee so that I, I wouldn't uh, freak out too much. And um, I remember the ambulance coming and being taken to the hospital and, and getting a hold of my husband to meet us there. And um, when the doctor finally came in and, and said to me, right, you know, the, the damage that you've done, um, yes, I think you could fix it with without surgery, but it, it's going to take about six to 12 months. And I thought, well, I have four, I have four months to get this done. So um, he looked at me and basically said, there's no way, there's no way you're going to make it to these Olympic games. There, there, there's just, it's, it's not going to happen. And um, so you can imagine that, you know, four months before the Olympic games where you were wanting to win an Olympic gold medal, um, you've now been told, you're, it's, it's not there. there. There's nothing you can do. And I remember leaving the hospital a couple hours later in a big brace and I couldn't even sit in the front of the car. I had to sit in the back across the whole, the whole car. And I remember my husband driving me home and he was just trying to be as supportive as he could saying, I'm sure there's something we can do. Um, you know, let's just get home, take a few days to rest. And then let's go to the physiotherapist and, and see if, if there's something that we can put together. And so we did. Over that weekend, we, we took the time to rest. I took the time to cry a lot. Um, and on Monday, my, my coach and my husband and I went to some very good physiotherapists that put out a plan and basically said, right, it's going to be extremely hard. Do we think that, you know, you can get back to where you were? Um, I think they were just telling me yes uh, at the time because they wanted me to believe it. Um, but they did and put together a plan that seemed doable. Um, and it started with the simplest, simplest of things, just trying to basically balance on my leg because I had lost so much uh, muscle around my knee that I, I couldn't even stand on, on that one leg and balance. And we went day by day. And I was very, very lucky to have the supportive team around me, my husband, my coach, my physiotherapist, that help me stay positive because there were those days where things would go really well. And then I would go into the physio room the next day and I couldn't do any of the exercises I had done before. And it was the most frustrating thing because it felt like we would take one step forward and then three steps back. And this continued for about a month and a half. And when we were getting close to about two months of doing consistent physio every day for about three hours, um, I was able to get into the pool and I would strap um, something around my waist and swim in one position. So I was still in the water. I wasn't able to kick, but at least I was using my arms. And we were coming up to about the two month mark. And um, I finally got the sign off from my physio that I could try to kick my legs and push off the wall, which was huge. It was a huge step forward. And I remember being very nervous about trying it because you don't want to hurt yourself even more. But again, I relied on my coach walking me through and my husband was there and, and it was all positive and it went well. And I remember getting into the car, driving home and just being so excited and just thinking, right, that is the turning point. That's a turning point. That's a good thing. We've achieved this. I can push off the wall. I can kick. If we can get it coming back slowly, 
there's still a chance. There's still a chance, maybe not of getting onto the podium at the Olympic Games, but making the Olympic Games and representing my country. And um, at about two in the morning that night, I had to wake my husband up and something was wrong. Um, I am asthmatic and I just was having a hard, uh, hard time breathing. And so he got me in the car and, and, and raced me to the hospital. And a few hours later, I was diagnosed with pneumonia. Um, I had blood and fluid build up in my lungs. And I, again, just sat there thinking, what the heck? Like, I've just taken one step forward. We're, we're nearly, you know, not back on track from where we were, but we were getting close to being there. And to have another hit like that, where I was now being told, you've got to go on bed rest for the next 10 days. And then when you come off of bed rest, we have to test your lungs and then you'll be allowed to go very back, uh, very slowly back into the way that you were training. And again, that, that mental um, block that I think all of us have faced when we have challenges um, of just, man, what, what is next? What are you going to throw at me now? Um, and how is this fair? Um, how could this be happening to me when all the rest of my competitors are training and they're healthy and fit and now I'm going through this again? Um, and my coach looked at me in the hospital and she just said, you know what? Things happen for a reason. There has to be some greater reason. Maybe it is God's way of putting things in your way that are showing you just how strong you can actually be and just how mentally tough you are. But maybe it's just not the right time. Maybe London wasn't supposed to be your swan song. Maybe London, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. And so with that, we went home and I, I was in bed for the next 10 to 12 days and then got signed off from the doctor that I could slowly get back into practice. At this time, my knee had healed pretty well and I was training. Um, I was an individual medley swimmer, so I had to kick breaststroke. That I didn't really do until about a week before the Olympic Games. Um, and throughout this time, it wasn't the actual challenges of getting through the dislocation or getting through the pneumonia it was getting my mind wrapped around how i had to adjust my goal that for me i think was the hardest thing that i had to try and adjust because for four years the goal was to win a gold medal now the goal had to be changed to i just want to get to the olympic games and I want to try and do my best for my, not just myself, but my country. Um, and if I look back now, a lot of the mental strength or the resilience um, of how I adapted to that changing of goals was due to the people around me to my family, to my husband, to my coach, to my weight coach, uh, to my physios, to my doctors, who just by being positive, by looking at a situation that wasn't a good situation, but looking at a situation in terms of what can we do? My coach never looked at the injury or the pneumonia as a complete stopping block. She looked at it and made me see it as, okay, now we need to break down certain aspects of what we were doing and look at what we still can do. And I think that for me was one of the biggest, um, not just challenges within my Olympic career, but really one of the times that I now can look back on and that time helps me get through difficult times now today because it taught me that along the road that we're walking along there are always going to be different challenges but it's the way in which we 
react to those challenges. It's the way in which we respond to those challenges. And it's the way in which we allow people around us to help us through those challenges. If I had just listened to the doctor's initial response of you're not going to make it and not to the people around me that knew me, that knew how competitive I was, that knew my spirit and that knew that we could maybe not get back to the original goal, but somewhere pretty close, I never would have made it to London and I never would have made the Olympic final. I ended up coming sixth in the world after all of this. And yes, it wasn't the gold medal that I wanted, but it was one of the best Olympic games that I got to experience because there was a lot of pressure that was not there anymore. I got to enjoy and, and watch other athletes compete at a level that I knew what it was and, and how it felt to be at that level of, of, of strength, of, of, um, of readiness. Um, and it allowed me to look at things in a different way and, and to look at a situation that is challenging, but figure out how, even if it's small ways, we can make something that's challenging positive and, and, and change it for the better. And so that was really the, the story that I wanted to share with all of you today. Um, and it has not just changed me and, and how I look at things, but again, coming back to building resilience among our, our youth um, as part of our national development, as part of the sustainable development goals globally, it's so important to allow for young people to figure out how it is that they can look and address challenges and, and how they can be mentally strong within their different communities. And so, again, I would just, I really want to thank everyone for, for putting this, this together. Um, it's so important. It's, um, I think, a, a great um, initiative in terms of the different speakers that I know are, are coming uh, after me and I would like to thank all of them for joining and I'm extremely looking forward and, and happy uh, to keep working with Consolidated Africa Services and all of its partners to uh, hold future resilience symposiums uh, and I know there's a resilience symposium hopefully next year where we'll all be meeting uh, in person um, and so just thank you for all the good work that you're doing and, and, and continue to uh, to reach new heights and, and new goals. Thanks, a, uh, Andy. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, you know, it's interesting because you obviously started your career at an early age. I mean, I would say that you were a teenager, if I can say that, every day getting up. I don't know what time you had to get up, how many hours every day you had to be in the pool, in the gym. Uh, you know, at that age, how, how, how do you think you managed to achieve that um, bearing in mind you're a teenager and obviously there's teenager, teenager things that you need to do. How did you keep that discipline, that mental, that mental discipline? And even when you're like there on the side of the pool, you're there against the world's best and you have to say to yourself, I can win this, I am the best. How, how do you think mentally you, you can prepare yourself, you prepared yourself for something like that? So, I, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think in teenage years, um, I was very much, I, I was very competitive growing up. Um, I, I always have been, I hated to lose. So I think that was just a natural instinct in me that allowed me to really push myself. Um, I was nine years old when I told my dad that I wanted to go to the Olympic games and win a gold medal after watching the 1992 uh, games in Barcelona. And that alone, you know, sharing that dream, uh, especially around, amongst your peers uh, in the sort of 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age, probably not the best thing I ever did. It didn't win me any friends, definitely got made fun of. But I think that pushed me even more into the pool because it allowed me to uh, prove them wrong. And that was really sort of what that fire that sort of uh, sort of lit that spark within me during those teenagers year, teenage years was um, I was bullied, I was made fun of. Um, and so swimming became a space in which I was able to just be myself and it gave me a lot of confidence. 
Um, and it was sort of my quiet space almost. And I think that really is what helped me through those years in terms of staying motivated and staying, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, maybe uh, focused, I guess, um, on, on those goals and those dreams that I had. Um, getting up early in the mornings, I, I hated, I still hate getting up early in the mornings. I don't enjoy getting into cold water, all things that I had to do. But I can say that at the end of the day, when I stood on that podium and, and I received my gold medal, I didn't remember any of those bad things. I didn't remember, you're not, you don't stand there and think of, oh, I you know this really, I remember that one day that I hated doing this or my coach made me do this and it was terrible. You don't remember any of the, the bad stuff. Um, I think later on, when you sit down and think about everything that you've accomplished, it, you obviously think, wow, I was able to do that. And um, it was because I sacrificed this or sacrificed that. But um, in the time, it, it's very much worth it at the end of the day. Um, and I think mentally, it also came down to just having people around me that supported me, my parents and my family from when I was nine years old and told my dad, they were my biggest fans, my biggest supporters. Um, and they supported me in so many different ways. Yes, mentally, uh, but they also knew when I was trying to be lazy or trying to get out of something and my parents would simply just say to me, well, is that really gonna help you achieve your goal? And then they'd let me work it out. And then, um, yeah, they would support me in, in those ways as well of, of wanting it for myself. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to say, what, you know, we, we have to take a breather just now, but, uh, but what, what would you say, like if you had one sentence or, or, or one phrase that you could say to young people or anybody really about that mental resilience and toughness, what, what do you think your advice to them would be? My advice to them would be, don't expect everyone around you to believe what it is you want to achieve, but don't let that deter you. You are extremely resilient and you're stronger than you think, um, but not everyone is going to support you. Not everyone will believe in you and you have to be really strong and believe in yourself and, and fight for what you want. Minister Coventry, thank you very much for that inspiring words. I think, uh, I, I must be honest, that even here, here and around, around the world, we felt your pain when we, when we heard about your uh, kneecap going to the back of your leg. But uh, well, you got eight, eight medals at Olympic Games. Uh, that's brilliant. And the most decorated athlete in Africa. So uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> it is, of course, uh, Minister Coventry should be, will be with us throughout the course of uh, the symposium, and um, I'm sure we can ask him more questions later on in the panel discussions. Um, we are going to have to take a breather now, um, and of course, after we come back, we will be joined by David Richmond, he's the Chief Operating Officer of World Maker International, to just give us a, an overview of who WMI are, and also then to introduce our first speaker, Jeff Buchanan. Uh, this broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV network, ZTN, and our partners, World, World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our other partners, Consolidated Africa Services, PBO, Action Aid and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. After the video, as I said, uh, uh, David Richmond will be introducing WMI and also introducing our first speaker, Jeff Buchanan. Don't go away. We will be right back. Of leaders in creating the right environment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network, TN, and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services PBO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund ZRBF. Now, before the uh, breather, we heard from Minister Kirsty Coventry. She's Zimbabwe's Minister of Youth, Sport, Arts, and Recreation. I'd like now, now to introduce David Richmond. He's the Chief Operating Officer of World Make International, and he'll give you a briefing on WMI and also the importance of the symposium, and also to introduce our next panelist, uh, Jeff Buchanan. But before I go to Jeff, I just want to quote from Nelson Mandela. He said, lead from the back and let others believe they are in front. David, over to you. Thank you. Um, our reserves of human resilience have probably never been so drawn upon as, as they are today. Uh, we live in a sort of volatile 
uncertain, complex, ambiguous world that has really become adept at throwing the curveball at us. Uh, we need only dwell for a moment on the impact that COVID-19 is having right now across the world, impacting profoundly whether you're one of the world's biggest economies uh, or whether you're an individual in one of the world's poorest nations. It's impacting everybody at once. Aside from some of our scientists and maybe some of our public health experts, who amongst us would have predicted 12 months ago the seismic shock that has impacted all of us today? And it has done this at a time when our resilience has, is tested almost daily as a matter of routine, whether that's by natural disasters such as Cyclone Idai, the political divisions racing through some of our nations, war and conflict, financial crises, the increasing gap between the world's rich and poor, ever-increasing pressures of work in our technologically enabled workplaces, pressure on our natural resources and wildlife and much else besides. We live in a world that has never actually had the capacity or the capability to be more connected, yet there are times when I think we could all ask whether we have ever been less together, less together and our communities more fractured. While I accept this is a gloomy summary of the situation uh, we find ourselves in today, uh, and not all is bad, I know, um, Worldmaker International was founded with the specific and singular purpose of collaborating globally to improve our understanding of human resilience and to enable communities to become more resilient before, during and after adversity. Because what we do know is that every individual, every community has the strength to thrive and to tackle adversity with purpose and optimism and to thrive into the future. What we can do as Worldmaker International is to provide the framework, the education, and the resources that will allow that potential to be unleashed. And that is what today is about. And that is also what the forthcoming series of virtual summits is about, where we will focus in turn on supporting communities impacted by natural disasters, by COVID-19, by the human wildlife conflict, and in time, our economic resilience too. Today, I hope that you enjoy our time together and ask lots of questions. And I, I ask you please to be curious uh, and please do approach our panelists. If at any stage you want to know more about Worldmaker International during the course of this or subsequently, please visit our website. It's at www.worldmakerinternational.org. www.worldmakerinternational.org. Our leaders have a vital role in creating the environment that will allow resilient communities to grow and to flourish. That runs from our national leaders to our regional and local community leaders. And that is where we will turn to first today. You're about to hear from Jeff Buchanan. Jeff is a retired Lieutenant General who served for many years in the United States Army. He completed several operational deployments, including Afghanistan and Iraq. And in 2017, he was also deployed to Puerto Rico to lead all military relief efforts after Hurricane Maria. Jeff has an extraordinary wealth of leadership experience in a range of different settings, and I know that you will enjoy listening to him. Jeff, welcome. Thanks, David. I, I just want to start by saying it's, a, it's an absolute honor to, to join you, our other panelists, uh, Andy, Minister Coventry, and uh, everybody there in Zimbabwe today. I'd like to start out, if I may, with a question because I, I want to get anybody who's watching as well as our, as our other presenters thinking about this. And that is, uh, the question is, and I'll, I'll start with you, David. Uh, the question is, what do you think the difference is between leadership and management? It's, it, it's a good question, I, and I, I think that the, the fundamental difference for, from my perspective is that leadership is, is about people. Um, you, you lead people. You, can, you, can also, you, you manage rosters and you manage equipment and kit and timeframes and, and work programs, but you lead people. And leadership is a, is a deeply human dynamic, um, and, uh, and for me, that, that's at the heart of the, of the difference. Uh, thanks. And I'm not looking for a, uh, a right answer or anything. I just want to get people thinking about this. So, Andy, uh, I'd, like, I'd like your opinion. Do you have an opinion about this? What do you think the difference is between leadership and management? 
Um, well, <laughs> thanks, thanks for putting, throwing me under the bus there, Jeff. Um, well, I, th I think you're right. I think leadership, leadership, I think, can set the tone. I think good leadership obviously initiates followers. But I think a good leader as well makes sure that, uh, that followers are listened to, that their needs are looked after, and really that they can take the advantage. A good leader, I think, uh, is someone that you'd like to, you, you could follow and know that uh, he has time for you. And I think management, there, there is a room, I think, in, in my mind, that there's a role for good management. I think management is good, particularly for certain administrative issues. And I think, uh, to, honestly, I think if you can combine leadership and management, I think you have a good combination there. Thanks, Andy. I, I don't know if uh, Minister Coventry is still with us, but if she is, I'd I'd like her opinion. Uh, no, unfortunately, she's left us, Jeff. Okay. I would like to right, jump in. Oh, Can please. I give one example? Yes, please. Yes, please. This is Nyara Zai. I, I see leadership every day in the African women in my villages who wake up every day to dream and to be creative and to make it possible. I, I, see, I see that leadership every day. Um, which is very different from management because I see, um, I see the thinking, I see the visioning, I see the putting together various resources to making sure that not only do we thrive in our villages, but also we build a future. Thank you, ma'am. That, uh, that was wonderful. I, you know, I've thought about this a lot and uh, periodically I would be asked to come in and, uh, and you know, teach a class at a MBA program. And they want me, when they bring me in, they want me to talk about leadership. Uh, but I open with this question because I want people to think about it. And it seems to me that in its simplest form, management is just about making things happen. Leadership is influencing people to make things happen. And so, you know, and it's not that people aren't part of the management equation, they are but they are the critical component in the leadership equation. It's, it's absolutely vital that uh, relationships are part of every influence situation. And those are relationships between the leader and the led, between the led and the leader across peers outside of the organization. So I ask all of our listeners or, or viewers today to think about leadership. And I think that, you know, the big ideas of leadership, whether you're, in sports, in a, uh, a disaster relief situation, within military operations, in government, in business, the big ideas are pretty universal, but it boils down to relationships. David, I know uh, you and I have talked about this a lot uh, in the past. Uh, perhaps you have some questions for me. Yeah, I mean, what. Jeff, when you reflect back on your leadership experience, what, what do you think is the most experience, most important leadership quality that, that you would put your hand on? Thanks. Thanks, David. You know, there's been a, a lot written about it and a lot of big ideas, but it seems to me that especially the more senior one gets, I think the most important quality is humility. And we have a tendency to confuse sometimes humility with modesty. Uh, there's an American author, poet, wonderful person to read if you have, never have is uh, Maya Angelou. But she has a quote that uh, to me really explains it uh, in, a, in a very clear way. She said, you don't want modesty, you want humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And so the idea is, you know, as you get into be a more senior leader, it seems like people expect us, they want to hear us talk. When, frankly, I think the most important quality one can have is to listen, to, uh, to embrace the idea of listening to others. Uh, we may have good judgment, we have a lot of instincts, but nobody has the market cornered on good ideas. And so I found that even in a crisis situation, uh, when I was able to bring people together with diverse perspectives, different backgrounds, they tend to look at the world differently and listen to them, I got a lot better ideas and, and ended up making better decisions. 
Um, Jeff, if I may, um, I know David, in his introduction of you mentioned that you were in Puerto Rico where they had that uh, terrible disaster, I think it was with a hurricane. And, and you also mentioned it in your, in, in your, in your introduction now, in your, in your uh, presentation about people being important in this. So in any type of situation like that, how do you balance the issue of bringing in essential services uh, like electricity, power, and so on, water, running water, healthy water, and so on? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you merge the two between that and also looking after people's needs and also looking after their mental needs and resilience in terms of leadership? What, what, what would you propose there? Well, first, and this goes to humility. I, I think you have to, um, if you're going to be successful, you have to understand the struggles that people are facing. You have to listen to them, uh, spend time with them. You know, it, sometimes it's easy in, in a crisis to you know, just try to surround oneself inside a headquarters or something like that and solve problems. But you, but I would suggest that if that's your world, you're rarely going to get an honest view of what the true problems are. You have to get out and spend time with the people and try to understand what their real struggles are. And what you find is that, that when you do so, you can bring truth back to the headquarters. You know, because the people in the headquarters are, tend to be prisoners of that situation. But it, as a commander, as a leader, if you can spend time with people and understand what their struggles are, I think you can be much more successful. You know, we have this principle in the military. Uh, and uh, even, even though David is from the UK and I'm from the United States, some of these principles are, uh, are pretty universal. One of them is unity of command. Uh, and so the big idea is that in a, in a military operation, you should have one person in charge. But, you know, frankly, that's not how the world works. I know David and I share experience in Afghanistan. If you go to Afghanistan today, there's about 40 member nations, uh, 40 militaries from 40 different countries participating. About two, two thirds of those are there on a NATO authority. Many are not. And, you know, Australia, Sweden, Georgia, all these countries are there. Uh, and if the commander tried to give them orders exactly what to do, their first call back is going to be to their nation's capital. So what's really important is not unity of command, it's unity of effort. And I found the same thing working with, with disaster relief organizations, non-governmental organizations, charities. How can we work together to achieve a larger purpose? And if you can help define that purpose, everybody can contribute. And it's not about who's in charge but it starts with a spirit of listening. Uh, Jeff, um, the, you know, uh, it's interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, David. So one, one of the uh, evident challenges of bringing is of dropping yourself into an environment where there are so many other organizations and so many other nations is the challenge of different cultures. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the, on the challenges of working with different cultures? Thanks, uh, thanks, David. I've seen this, uh, I've seen it many times where uh, where we fail because we don't have an understanding of culture. You know, culture in this sense is, it's a, a set of rules. Many times they're unwritten rules, but it's how we in our defined organization or country uh, look at the world, how we interpret the world and how the world works, what, what is okay and what is not okay. You know, here's a quick example. Go to a ski slope and look at how the differences between how Europeans and Americans look, what is fair and who gets in, who is able to cut in the line or not. You know, those are just differences in culture. There's not a right way or a wrong way, but that's how, that's how it's described. I saw this fail. I think the biggest failures I saw was initially uh, my first tour in Iraq in, uh, in 2003. I'll just give you a very quick example. Um, a, a story, here's an, an American colonel talking to an Iraqi sheikh, and the very first time they meet, you know, the colonel says, Salam alaikum, peace be with you. Uh, I've looked at your situation here, and it seems to me you have five core problems. There are one, two, three, four, five. And what I think is that if you implement this set of solutions, A, B, C, D, E, you'll be successful. What do you think? And the Iraqi Sheikh says, alaikum salam, which means peace be with you too. Uh, I'll see what I can do. And then they part. 
Now the American Colonel looks at it and says, wow, we're off to a great start. We had a good meeting. We already talked about the problem and everything else. The Iraqi Sheikh is looking at that thinking, that guy's an idiot. How could he possibly know what my problems are? He, this is the first time we've met. He doesn't know me. And oh, by the way, when he said, I'll see what I can do, that's an, an Iraqi and Arabic in general way, polite way of saying, I'm never gonna do this, <laughs> you know? So what's the difference? It's culture. So if we're gonna be successful, I think we need to be students of culture and we need to try to under, go back to that definition of leadership. If leadership is about relationships and it's about influencing people, we gotta start by trying to understand what is their perspective. You know, and I'll, I'll just make one more comment about culture in Puerto Rico. There was this news going on about and, and, you know, generalizations, but this buzz in the international press and in the U.S. national press about, oh, Puerto Ricans are, are selfish, they're lazy, they're not going to do much to help themselves. I got to tell you, I, that is not what I saw when I was out. In fact, more so than maybe in almost any place else in the United States, community and family was very, very important. So I was able to use my own observations of culture and action to counter this growing narrative. Uh, so anyway, thanks for the question, David. I think it's culture is very important. And if we're gonna be successful, um, we need to be students. Of it. Yeah, Jeff, um, it's interesting because there, there is sometimes a resistance in countries, uh, even in Africa, that uh, people are coming from outside the continent or coming from outside the countries and wanting to impose their solutions or their, or their will on, on the country itself. So how do you think you can be successful as an outsider when actually trying to help people in an environment that isn't your own? Thanks, Andy. You know, a lot of times when people want me to, or they want to um, bring that kind of a solution about, they start by saying, well, how can we get local buy-in? Or, you know, again, I'll go back to my early days in Iraq. We want to put an Iraqi face on this. What does that really mean? So when you think about it, putting an Iraqi face on something means we're just going to make it look like an Iraqi solution uh, when in fact it's our own. And if we're trying to get buy-in, what does that mean? Well, to me, that means we're trying to sell somebody something. That's not what we want, and it never works. I think you've got to start with un trying to understand them and their perspective, and then working together and helping them find solutions that are going to work for them, that'll be lasting. Uh, it's a very different approach. Uh, but I think that's, that's how you can be important or, or successful as an outsider is not assuming you know the answer. But starting with big, I, I like to say big ears and a little mouth. Listen and try to understand and then you can help people find solutions that will work in their own situation. That's great. Now, I, I wonder if we, uh, we might now just bring in, um, bring in Ed home as well as the, and, and move to the the leadership question and answer panel. Um, Ed is the group chair of Pomelo and Consolidated Africa Services. And he is, by his own admission, absolutely passionate about Zimbabwe, about leadership and shining a light on the critical issues that our future generations will have to contend with. Ed, um, welcome to the, to the panel. Uh, and um, could you just tell us a little bit, Ed, straight off about what brought about this resilience symposium? You've, you've led the uh, the work to create it and to form it in, in Zimbabwe. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Thanks, David. Yeah, absolutely. Before I do, I would like to um, extend my thanks to Minister Coventry, to ZTN and all of our partners, and of course, to World Maker International. Um, and picking up straight away with uh, what Jeff was there talking about in terms of leadership management and the role of leadership and bringing in international assistance. In this, in this case, we have Willmaker here, we've got ActionAid here, and we've got uh, ourselves here in Zimbabwe. And how we link together, we're either partnering from an inclusive perspective or looking at the crisis response components uh, that will be discussed in more detail from a resilience perspective. If people are coming into a country, for example, on a crisis response piece, 
then I think the, the, the unstated strap line could be how to, as quickly as possible, do oneself out of a job. In, or, in other words, get in, provide the assistance and get out to allow the communities to return to some form of normality. Then for the longer term, more sustainable relationship, But we seem seem to have lost Ed um, temporarily, at least. Um, Jeff, maybe maybe while we're, we're trying to find Ed again, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the lessons that you perhaps learned during your time overseeing the recovery efforts. Okay. I think David, we've got Ed. I think we've got Ed back. Uh, let's let's go. Back. Okay. Sorry. Can I can I say one thing real quick about I mean something Ed was saying? Do yourself out of a job it's a perfect way to look at a disaster. You know, what I found is in the military response in Puerto Rico, we were, we were there only for the emergency response. But if we stayed too long, we, our, our response efforts, our relief efforts actually get in the way of recovery. So we had, we had the USS Comfort, this big, huge white hospital ship parked in the port. And one of the things that we were doing was passing out free eyeglasses. And that sounds like a great initiative. People would come from all over the island to get their free eyeglasses. Uh, that worked for a while. But if you think about it, if you're an optometrist and you're trying to return to normalcy, what we were doing was preventing actual recovery. And, you know, we saw the same thing with bottled water. If you're a grocer and you sell bottled water, but we in the government are giving out free bottled water, that works when it's a real emergency. But when it's no longer an emergency, our efforts can actually get in the way of recovery. So anyway, Ed is exactly right. And uh, we've got to be smart about how we approach that. Jeff, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ed. Should we please switch back to Ed just to let him finish his answer? Thanks, David. Thanks, Jeff. What, what I may have been cut off saying is the longer term, more sustainable relationships and relationships being the key word, would we'll then look at more inclusive partnering arrangements where we are able to work more collectively um, as a global village of nations, if you like. So that's talking to what your, your earlier point, but why am I here? Why am I sitting here today? Um, from my own personal journey, my own personal experience, um, I've had a variety, I've come across um, an, a variety of mental health issues and as such have sought a greater understanding about mental well-being. This has led to our own attempts at putting something back about giving to explore these issues here at home in Zimbabwe. And where we first started in seeking uh, the discovery of, of the real issues here was holding small mental health awareness days in the medium and high density areas initially near Harare and then expanding out of that to gain a better understanding of the scale of the problem. And initially this was centered around alcohol and drug abuse issues and then grew to cover the wider spectrum of, of mental well-being. So we focused on a problem but have expanded into, and this will be explored later, on the spectrum of mental well-being. Fast forward to today, this virtual symposium made, uh, made real by great help from ZTN and Capital in this instance, was meant to be a face-to-face -face gathering in Victoria Falls. And that was brought about after my visit to London to meet Worldmaker and spend a couple of days looking at the Thrive model, which Molly will, will cover a little bit later. And very kindly, Worldmaker, ActionAid and other partners are getting around the table to continue this exploration of mental well-being and mental awareness in Zimbabwe. I'll give you a couple of other examples later but that's the reason why I'm here and I'm really grateful, really, to be listening to what's been said thus far and looking forward to the rest of it today. Thanks, David. Ed, thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, any other, any other reflections on, on Ed's um, views around creating a summit in a place like Zim, a country like Zimbabwe? Oh, well, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us in Worldmaker to get involved, to help, but also to learn. You know, to me, what can make us more relevant in helping people around the world is to, is to see different perspectives and learn from people in Zimbabwe. So I'm looking forward to staying engaged over the next year and hopefully making it to Vic Falls in person next year. Um, David, if I may, um, you know, if, uh, we're talking about leadership, but I think that 
to me, there's different types of leadership or different levels of leadership. Uh, and I think the one that I would like to look at, and I think, um, you know, as I mentioned it earlier, is that leadership at, at community level, the leadership at villages, at communities, and how that can also bring together the communities and also deal with some of these issues like mental health. Do you comment on that? Sure. Um, so I think that the most powerful way to influence other people is to lead by example. And, you know, if you think about it, I'll bet that uh, many of our listeners have worked for somebody in the past uh, who was not very inspirational. Um, and, and when that's the case, a lot of times it's because that person has a tendency to say, do as I say, rather than do as I do. So leadership, by example, uh, is, a, is a great way. When you show people what to do, how to behave, it's a very powerful impact, much more so than when you just tell them. And this is, gets directly at Ed's point about mental health. You know, we in the US military, and I know David in the, from the UK has had the same sort of thing. And that is, how do you deal with the stresses of the modern battlefield? And in the US, we had, we, you know, back in World War I, we called it shell shock. I think in World War II, we called it battle fatigue. But now today, what we know is it's called post-traumatic stress. Everybody potentially can be, it, it, it can be uh, affected by this, the stresses and what you see, and it can continue to affect one. But at the same time in the military, we have the stigma against seeking help. You know, we see it, we tend, because we're taught from a very early age to be self-reliant, we're there to protect other people, we don't think we we have this tendency to think it's weak to seek help from others but that's the one thing that we found has been that we've been successful in turning around this stigma against seeking help especially mental health for post-traumatic stress is leadership by example so when core leaders come out and say hey look i i was affected by this and i sought help that was a very, very powerful way to get other people on board, to let them know that they could succeed as well. I right, thank you for that. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our Q&A on the leadership issue. Um, <clears throat> of course, we'd like to hear from you, so please make sure your voice is heard. Uh, you can watch us on our Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network. And also there, please post your questions for our panelists on that site. We, have, we are compiling some questions now, which we will, of course, ask our panelists over time. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network, ZTN, and Worldmaker International. We'd like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services, PBO, ActionAid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. Don't go away. We will be right back. and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services PBO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund ZRBF. Now, as I said, and I've been saying throughout the show, we want to hear from you. And we're streaming this live on our Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network. So please, if you have any questions for our panelists, please post on our Facebook page. And we, of course, will be able to ask your, our panelists directly your questions. As I said, we want to hear your voice.
Now then, um, we're now moving on to our next panelist, and I'd like to cross over to uh, David Richmond to introduce the CEO of Worldmaker International. David. Andy, thank you. I mean, just before I do in, make the introduction, I just remind you, if you do want to know more about the work of Worldmaker International, uh, please visit the website www.worldmakerinternational.org and look out for information about our forthcoming series of four further webinars in Zimbabwe and the plans for the live summit next year. Uh, now let, let's turn to, uh, to the next speaker. Um, the people of uh, Zimbabwe are having to contend concurrently with the full range of challenges to their resilience. Uh, the impact of Cyclone Idai in the Eastern Highlands, the impact of COVID-19 in the tourist hubs of Victoria Falls and elsewhere, the conflict between humans and wildlife, and the resilience of the, the economy will be challenged during these difficult times. Common to all of these is the impact that all of these aspects and issues have on people and how resilient communities can thrive through and beyond these challenges. Molly Marty is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Worldmaker International. She is both an attorney and a social psychologist and trains and consults internationally to help pioneer the fields of trauma recovery, workplace mental health, school resilience and human resilience. Today she is going to introduce us to uh, the Thrive Resilience uh, Framework and then there will be a chance for questions. So please keep sending your questions in. Molly, welcome, and we're looking forward to hearing you speak. Thank you, David. Very happy to be with you today. So I was uh, considering slides and I just wanna talk a bit and give a, a background. Um, the other speakers are doing my work for me. They're really bringing the work to life. So I think let's start with a working definition of human resilience. Human resilience is the capacity to prepare for, adapt to, and grow through adversity. And there are a lot of, I think, myths or misunderstandings about human resilience. And I just want to cover a few of those and then maybe we can move uh, into conversation more. Um, that word capacity is really important. It's not the ability, it's the capacity. Um, resilience is not something you either have or don't have. It can be grown, it can be cultivated. And so that's really important. And if you notice with the definition, it takes us all the way from preparation to adapting and coping to possibly growing through. And the minister's um, story and comments really brought that to life of how on the other end of all that adversity, she came out with a broader perspective and, and she has a strength that she still draws upon today um, from that experience. And so that's an, an important um, understanding. We also have already brought to light that resilience isn't simply about crisis response. Uh, certainly it encompasses preparation and crisis response, but it's that capacity building. And I wanna talk about a, a couple other um, myths. And one is that resilience is often referred to as grit. And again, while perseverance and understanding where you want to go is a piece of resilience, it's much more about being resourced than being resourceful. Um, when we have the resources, when we believe that we can use what we have to uh, move forward, um, we're much more likely to be able to use uh, all of our, our skills and our practices. Um, so at a core level, resilience is about relationships and being resourced. And uh, one last myth, David, it's often called the bounce back factor. And that is part of the, the definition. And you can think of that with the plant. It gets knocked down in a storm um, and it, it bounces back to where it was. Humans don't bounce back to where they are. Um, I think if I could ask for a show of hands of how many of you think that you'll go right back to where you were in February, 2020, uh, after COVID-19 uh, moves beyond, um, if and when. Um, because that also is adapting, it's part of the human system, um, not many hands would be raised. And so it's that uh, adaptation and growth and learning and how can we together come through these adversities, uh, perhaps a little bit smarter or stronger or wiser, more connected um, with more of a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. So that's a lot of talking for me. Um, I'd like to throw it back to you and we can get into the Thrive Model 
however you like. If I could, if I could kick off. You, you said something which I'd, I'd like you to expand a little bit on. You said resilience can be grown and cultivated. How, how, how does that happen? How does that work? Because you're talking about maybe communities which could be isolated or, or in different areas or rural remote areas of a country like, say, Zimbabwe. How do you cultivate or grow that resilience uh, spirit or, or feeling amongst people? It's a great question, Andy. The, um, we call it a, a four, five, six model, uh, but the six part of Thrive, so the four are these four pillars of well-being. We need to understand our core basic human needs and how to respond to those. The five are individual practices that we can use to grow resilience. And then we get to six, which for years, I really feel it's the heart of it. And, and we have been focusing on that, which is that culture of resilience. And fortunately, the research is, is friendly in that area and it allows us to map on to the acronym T-H-R-I-V-E, the Thrive um, factors. And so the first factor, that T, is trusted relationships and the research across the areas from education to we work a lot with, with military and transitions to civilian life, first responders, um, all across uh, businesses, all across these sectors. And we've been talking about that um, already. The minister talked about the importance of her husband, her coaches, her doctors, um, those people that surrounded her. So we uh, focus very strongly in getting that piece in place so that everyone is connected to someone that they trust who encourages them and um, affirms them and, and helps resource them. The H is high expectations, uh, providing that um, belief that um, we can move to that higher place and, and pairing that with the needed support. Uh, R is resilient skills. And so I think that goes to the heart of your question. Um, these are skills, these are practices. They can be learned and uh, developed. The I is involvement. We are designed as humans to want that and need that purpose and to be making meaningful contributions to our community. We're tribal beings and we need each other in so many ways. And so we get people involved in, in contributing their unique um, skills and, and gifts and talents. Uh, the V is vision, that piece of, of hope and actually co-creating a, a positive future step by step. And the E is enrichment. And that's an emphasis that none of what we're talking about today is, is a one and done or you know, a simple, you know, we can't just sit here today and give you the top three things that everyone on this uh, call and in this um, event can do to grow their resilience. It's a process of, of continually um, enriching ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis and to have toolkits and practices. And so that's kind of the structure of the, the Thrive model. And, and when we say cultivating resilience, and this is something I'm a, a Midwest, uh, United States girl, farm country, I get this. Um, my, my friends and colleagues in Zimbabwe um, also seem to really resonate with that concept of cultivation um, and how we can do this work uh, together over time. Well, it, it seems that um, in how you describe it, your human relationships and being part of something bigger than yourself, um, it seems to be right at the heart of developing your resilience. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah but I think that even goes to the why are we world maker? What does that word mean? And I want to share the story. You, you were there as well. We were hosting an international resilience symposium in Chicago a few years back. And that's when we were doing the work under the National Resilience Institute, which I, I had founded in the United States. Um, after my own community lost uh, a few lives to suicide and mental health issues. And we, uh, we knew that it was important to educate people in their communities. So we had been doing a lot of that. And then the researchers and the practitioners started to say, can we come together? Can we have these conversations? Can we move this field forward together? And so we were at this symposium that we were hosting in Chicago and Dylan Tett, one of the participants, who works with uh, veteran assistance and transitions, talked about this word world making that came from the literature, um, social work literature supporting veterans and how each veteran as they transition to civilian life are being tasked with creating a world anew, a world of purpose and connection and you know, meaning and that sense of, of being good and competent at things, right? They have that, um, task because they had all of that when they were serving and and they need to create that anew 
And you, you were there, you could feel that in the room. We thought, not only are we tasked with that individually, but we're being called to help others in that process and um, really taking a look globally at our world. What kind of world are we creating? What kind of world is a world worthy of our children and our grandchildren? And, and collectively, what can we accomplish if we come together and start to do this work? And so um, we're tasked uh, on a global level, I believe. Uh, resilience work, in my opinion, and my experience is humanitarian work. And it's that process of um, helping every individual and every community step up and understand what they have to work with and the resources and, and the depth that they have and then to engage in that process where they start to experience that sense of purpose and meaning and contribution. And just, just reflecting on, on what you've said there and also what Jeff was talking about earlier, now how, how do you think that the, the community leaders, um, what role can they play in, in, in helping build resilience in their communities? And I was doing a lot of head nodding. I, I believe leadership is, um, you know, management is outward focused. And, uh, and to your point, it, I don't care to use the word manager with people uh, as, as much um, as tasks and procedures and processes. Um, leadership is about looking inward and doing that inward work. And leadership, similar to resilience, begins with ourself. Um, it, we cannot lead someone past our own point of healing. We cannot lead someone past our own point of having done that work on ourselves. Uh, leadership and resilience both require a, a, a depth of, of self-awareness and you know, know yourself and be true to yourself. And when you show up in that way, um, you lead by inspiring, you lead by role modeling. And that I think is the, the key uh, for our community leaders and, and ideally our national and global leaders. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to take a step back, actually. But you mentioned a few minutes ago the four pillars of resilience. Sorry, four pillars of well-being. Can you just tell us a little bit more about, about what those pillars are, how we strengthen them, uh, and um, maybe a share a tool, perhaps, that, um, that people can start using today to strengthen those pillars? Sure. So the, the four pillars um, really relate to our four core human needs. Uh, the four pillars are safety, belonging, competence, and purpose, right? Initially, we need a sense of, of, of safety, and that's not simply physically safety and security, but also psychological. Uh, we need to be uh, centered and calm and, and believe um, that, that we are safe and, and not threatened uh, by outside uh, people or forces. We need to have a sense of belonging, um, and even start to safety, I, I think about how that's been, um, and we'll talk about COVID specific, I'm sure, but you can see how all of these, I, I would like you to be thinking about that in your own life as I talk through these is, is the invitation I would like to everyone uh, listening. So we have safety, we have belonging. Uh, like I mentioned, we are tribal uh, beings. We, we need our tribe. We need to feel seen and accepted and, and heard and valued um, and connected. We have a need for competence. Uh, we need to believe and see that we have the resources and can use those to uh, meet our objectives, that we have a, a, some sense of control over things that are important to us, that we um, are seen as being good at something that's important to us. And then we have a need for purpose. So the fourth pillar is purpose uh, that we've already talked about a bit. The key is to understand that when those needs are violated, um, when we don't feel safe, we feel threatened, when we don't have a sense of belonging, we feel isolated. When we don't have that sense of competence, we feel powerless. And when we don't have that sense of purpose, we feel useless. And when we are feeling these ways, when we are feeling threatened or isolated or powerless or useless, it erodes our well-being and it erodes resilience. And so the, the I guess the quick tool uh, that I, I would share today is to start with an understanding that all behavior communicates a need. And this is true for ourselves. So we can look at what's going on with us. Um, it said COVID gives us a very easy context to do that. Um, you know, how, am, how safe am I feeling? In what ways am I feeling unsafe? Um, am I feeling isolated in, in this time where I need to be in and, and um, communicate virtually? Um, has my job or work 
um, or life situation shifted where I'm not feeling that sense of competence. Um, and, and how can I engage, you know, so I, I grow this sense of purpose. This isn't a stair step. Uh, many people might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you really can, and we've seen this, uh, the research supports it, engage in any of these pillars and, and grow from there. So you don't need to start at one and, and move your way through. So the tool I would encourage is, is just really to understand that all behavior communicates a need and ask how can I respond to the need rather than react to the behavior. Um, we, we are tucked in here with our families, <laughs> we're tucked in with, with people that maybe we don't spend as much time with, um, and, and it's so easy to react to the behavior and think, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? I've told you not to do it, or you know this is unacceptable. Why do you keep doing this? And we react to that behavior. And so how can we continue to learn to step back and have a curiosity, have an open-mindedness, ask what, what's their story? What's going on here? What need is being manifested here? And we have found in our, our work that one of the most powerful questions is, is simply to ask, what can I do right now to move into relationship? How can I take a step back? And despite all that's going on, you know, the emotions or the behaviors of this other person, not react to them, but ask that question, what can I do right now to move into relationship? Because we know that it is only in relationship that we can begin to help others heal, mend, um, and grow their resilience. Hi, just to remind you that we're streaming live on Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network, and we'd like to hear from you. So please post your questions on our Facebook page, and of course we will ask our panelists uh, your questions directly. Uh, Molly, I, I want to just focus on your slide number six. You said culture of resilience. Now, uh, just, just for clarification, I mean, resilience doesn't, doesn't imply that there has to be a disaster or some sort of uh, calamity happening around you. We're here talking about about issues that people, even, even in countries where sometimes it's not happening, um, you know, this culture of resilience needs to be built up. Maybe you could talk a bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, going back to that definition of, of preparing for and then coping and adapting and growing through, we know it's part of our human experience that these adversities are not a matter of if, but when. Like David said, not many of us saw COVID uh, coming. We actually have some uh, experts on our, our world maker team that did see it coming. Uh, the epidemiologists and public health people um, actually wrote books and articles uh, about such a situation. Um, I wasn't among, uh, among those. Um, so that's just one example of adversity. We've talked about the cyclone um, and, and others. So that's a piece of it because it's this constant process of preparing and the, and the first step of uh, resilience is surviving. We need to survive in order to thrive. So that, that's an important piece, but it's also learning and growing um, as we adapt to adversity so that we're better prepared for the next one. And that's something we have seen in communities that have been hard hit um, by the time that the next flood or cyclone or hurricane, or it can look very different. It might be a natural disaster and then they have um, another type of adversity, they're better prepared if they've done that work. So that's a, a piece. Um, but absolutely, this, this Thrive 6, as we call it, the, the trusted relationships, high expectations, resilience skills, involvement, vision, enrichment, those are ongoing pieces. And uh, an important tool, I think, with this is, is just looking at what are our expectations. Um, we tend to see, as humans, what we look for. And what we focus on expands. And so this is a, there, there's a parable I, I enjoy sharing when we teach called the parable of the two travelers. And it's a short story about how um, a traveler approached a man at the ancient gates of the city. And the traveler said, uh, old man, what are the people like in the city? I'm, I'm coming here and what will I find? And the old wise man said, well, what were the people like where you came from? And he said, oh, they were terrible. They were backstabbing and unhelpful and wanted power and all this fighting. And I'm just glad that they're in the rearview mirror. And the man said, um, well, sadly, I expect that you will find the same is true here. And a while later, another traveler came along and asked the very same question. Old man, what are the people like here in this city? And the old man again said, 
well, what were the people like where you came from? And the man said, oh, they were good. They were kind, they were helpful, they were friends and, mm -hmm. and very sad to have left them behind. And the old man said, I expect you will find the same here. Right? Our expectations are so powerful. And, and even uh, ministry, Coven, the minister uh, Coventry had talked about her expectations and that was the hardest piece that she had to shift. Um, and she did that work and, and, and it drove her forward. Um, and that's the same true for our communities. That's the same, especially true in our interactions. She also needed her husband and her doctors and her coaches um, to adjust their expectations. And she said the doctor had told her one thing because he wanted her to believe that most likely. It, it's, it's a powerful, powerful piece that, that runs through that Thrive model. So that's, I guess, an invitation I would make as we just start this work and start these conversations um, and start our own considerations of what does resilience look like for you, for your community, for your region, for your country, and, and really looking at those expectations. They're powerful. Yeah. And we, we've talked quite a bit during the course of today already around about individual resilience and community resilience. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about about how they how they in, interact, interlock with each other and their relationship with each other, if there's a difference? There is a difference. And, and David, I come to this work um, on, on community and cultures of resilience after a decade of working with uh, world and Olympic competitors and business people. I love individual resilience. I love success mindset. I, I, I ate up everything that the minister was talking about. Um, this really compelling story. And that was my world until we lost three children to suicide. And I took a step back and thought in, in what world is this okay that we'll just carry on life and not treat this like the existential crisis it is that we have young people losing their lives. And, and um, I was really focused on that spectrum of peak performance and thinking that I understood resilience. Um, and I didn't, I understood peak performance and success mindset and working with the top one, two, you know, three percent of competitors in, in different areas. So I knew I needed to learn <laughs> to just point the most important thing. And I knew I needed to teach. I was teaching at the university here in the States. And um, I looked around the world at where we could learn the most, um, the most quickly. And we settled on the uh, Israel Trauma Coalition, which had been doing this work in a non-political, non-partisan way. Mm -hmm for several years and um, we went and we studied there. And it was at this moment where um, I was at their, their shelters uh, at schools. So they have their schools, but the homes have shelters and the, the schools have shelters. And I um, was hearing the story of a, a mother who um, got the two oldest children under shelter, but she, the, she thought that the four-year-old could make it on her own and, and she didn't. And, um, and the whole country's mapped out in code red. And I, and I always want to say this, um, my heart goes out you know, to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Every time I talk about our Israeli brothers and sisters, um, my heart is right there with our Palestinian brothers and sisters and a hope for ultimate peace and um, our way forward together. But in the context of the story, that was my experience that I thought this whole country is mapped out and they know how many seconds they have when there's a code red to get under that shelter. And I was in the south of Israel and they have 15 seconds or you can lose your life, you can lose your, a child's life. And, and yet working in that community and those community centers and with those people and the work they were doing, they were carving out these lives where they could create even no matter how small, the small sense of safety. They were creating these lives of connection and finding meaning and purpose and, and, and creating these, these lives of, of value and worthiness and um, they were doing that together. And I thought, this is resilience. You know, getting under that shelter, that's survival. Um, and maybe so, there's some people that can do it really fast. That's peak performance, right? That was my world. And so I did this deep dive into, okay, what does this look like in its entirety? And what does this look like, especially for people and communities who have been impacted by trauma? People and communities who are immersed in this toxic stress. So even might not be a specific traumatic event or loss, but every day they get up and there's, there's poverty and there's crime and there's lack and, and oppression 
right? What does that look like? And so that's been the last decade of my life, that dedication to, to understanding that and creating tools from that, re, from that research. And so they're, they're intimately connected, the individual and the community. Um, they, they grow together. And as we uplift uh, one, you know, we uplift all. Uh, Molly, we will be going for a breather shortly, but uh, of course there will be a Q&A on resilience a bit later on. But I just wanted you to think about something because we are getting a few questions coming through um, which will be interesting and I will ask them later. But just, just to give it some thought, uh, one question was, does the Thrive model you mentioned, um, one size fits all, that's from David and Harare, um, you know, can you take that model and apply it to different countries as it stands? And another question which was interesting as well, um, which is Nyarazzo as well, coming out, I think, again in Harare. We have a lot of Harare people, but please keep your questions coming in. Is the in slide four, you talked about pillars of well being and the linkage between that and e economics, uh, money in terms of uh, ability to make a living, ability to, uh, to actually thrive in an economic environment. So if you could think about those and we will get you, we'll get you when we come back to the Q&A. We'll have to take a breather now. This forecast is brought to you by Zen Papers, TV Network, ZTN and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services, PBO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. This forecast is streaming live on Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network. Now, after the breather, we'll hear from Deborah Machando. She's a clinical psychologist. Don't go away. We will be right back. Society, the role of leaders in creating the right environment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network ZTN, and of course, we are in Harare, Zimbabwe, and our partner, World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services PBO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund ZRBF. Now, this broadcast is streaming out live on our Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network. So. Please, if you have any questions for our panelists, please post them on that site, and we will, of course, will be able to quickly give our panelists the questions and so they can answer, answer them. Now, we've had an it's interesting debate and discussion up to now, and I think it continues from going forward. I would like now to uh, cross over to David Richmond to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Deborah Machado. David? David? Andy, uh, thank you. Um, I think we've heard a lot today that we're always stronger together. Communities uh, bring people together in a way that ensures that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, strong communities have also been the foundation of our civilization for thousands of years. And ironically, uh, during an age when we have technology to bring us closer together, whatever the physical distances between us, in many places, some would say we've seldom felt further apart. Deborah Machado is an award-winning clinical psychologist who, uh, in her own words, lives and talks mental health. She is a lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Zimbabwe and runs corporate wellness programs and provides psychological services in her private practice. Deborah, welcome, and we are looking forward to hearing you speak to us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. I am excited to talk about mental health. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So we want to today to look at um, how resilience and mental health are related. I'm going to share with you a WHO's definition of what uh, what mental health is. So when someone is mentally healthy, we are expecting them to be able to think clearly, solve their problems, relate with others very well, uh, work productively. Mm -hmm. Please take note: working productively. This is very important. Um, then they are forced to be able to feel spiritual at ease and should be able to adapt and cope with, um, you know, like a common life stresses. So they come in our resilience. We could say uh, there is no resilience without mental health. Because as you can see, if, I'm, um, if I borrow from Molly's definition earlier, we can paraphrase and say resilience is sort of stamina, being able to confront common problems and deal with them. So if you are not emotionally well, you will not be able to do that. Um, so there is no resilience without mental health. I'll give you um, simple examples of uh, common measurable problems that people face 
and how that might compromise their resilience. Let's look at um, depression, for example. Some of the symptoms of depression uh, include emotional problems. So this might look like a deep sadness, prolonged sadness, and inability to, be, to get pleasure in, in, in uh, activities that a person usually enjoys. Um, so one factor which is related, which has a lot of uh, uh, implications to resilience is how a person's cognitive function is impacted on by depression. It's actually either a cause for depression or it can be a symptom of depression. So uh, you'll find that a person who is depressed has poor decision making, he has uh, poor judgment, um, they worry a lot, so they worry about many things and worry for long times. In our settings, we get people saying, my head was full because they were thinking too much. Uh, that's what they say. Uh, what we also find peculiar is the, the, the negative thinking, the global negative thinking. So negative thinking about oneself, thinking that they are inadequate, again, you need that from zero. Um, negative thinking about the future, negative thinking about people. You need people for resilience because they are part of your resources. Um, so just, and you, you will notice that a lot of people will have poor insight. Uh, and when a person has poor insight, they are likely to uh, not judge properly their stamina, their ability to deal with their problem. Uh, so people who are depressed, they have memory problems, they have attention problems, and they have irrational thinking. So irrational thinking looks like uh, when something terrible happens, you personalize it and you blame yourself for what has happened. Um, I, I, I remember this one time I was asked to come and uh, present, uh, to make a, a, a mental health presentation at some function. And so it was raining heavy on that day, there was a heavy wind. The function was supposed to take place in a tent, so there was a huge tent set up and two chairs uh, for the function. A lot of people must have seen the rains coming and didn't come for that function. And as the time progressed with the heavy rains and the, and the, and the wind, the tent, part of the tent collapsed. So what fascinated me is how the person who had organized the program responded to that. So she said, you know why things never work for me? So everything I touch turns into dust from thinking. How are you taking responsibility for what's happening in, with the rains and the tents? How is that your personal problem? In another study that we are conducting, and so my heart really goes out to our communities, how they take responsibility for what, what they is not their own, and also how um, people are, find challenges dealing with what you think are simple problems. So this man had attempted suicide. And so we were trying to find out why he had atten attempted suicide. It was a study on depression and um, depression and HIV. So he says, I, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's worth my life is worth living. So when you hear someone speaking like that, you are quick to think, oh, they think HIV, you know, I should assure them now there is um, antiretroviral treatment. If you eat well, you'll be okay. But guess what? He wasn't worried about all that. He was worried that he had contacted this illness and now he was fed from God. He was built in, in salvation. So we find that uh, how one thinks about problems affect how they can be resilient to deal with those problems. Um, so with uh, depressive symptoms, a person feels worthless, they, they feel uh, hopeless, they feel helpless. And all these are the ingredients that you need uh, to be able to tackle uh, problems. Another common uh, mental health problems that people face is that, and this is very, we are getting a lot of that these days because of uh, fears, uncertainties about um, the COVID-19 infection. We found very interesting responses to this, but 
term. So generally, let me just start talking about what anxiety looks like. Um, usually, a person, so when someone is anxious, the problem might be there, the stressor could be there, but sometimes it's not even there. Because maybe someone is just anxious uh, to be in a closed gate where everybody goes up and down with that gate. So the stressor may actually not be there, but in, in, in instances where it's there, you find that um, a person overrates the amount of stress compared to their capacity to deal with it. I, I, I liked the earlier presentation by Molly where she says, everyone has capacity. Um, you, there is, everyone has an, a, 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 an ability to, to grow that capacity, to culture it. Okay? So when a person is anxious, they already conclude that they are not able to deal with the problem. They look at it, they catastrophize uh, whatever problem that they are looking at. And usually people then become anxious about being anxious. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I getting depressed? Is there something wrong with me? And again, that um, shakes, that um, weakens their, their ability to be resilient. So, um, what I also find interesting, sadly though, is that um, mental health problems sort of break the person. I like to think of resilience and liken it to your gym instructor. You know, gym instructors, you don't see them with their heads on the side looking sad. They, they walk stretching out their muscles like they own the world. So that's my picture of resilience. But mental health, uh, unfortunately, sort of breaks you. And you feel that you are not capable of dealing with the problems that you, that you have. I often see people, when they come in, they're depressed. They are all tearful and they are thinking that they are not capable of dealing with what, of handling what's, what's on their plate. And they are thinking that it's the end of the world. But you know, it's, um, as they get better and better, as the depressive symptoms lift and the anxiety uh, lifts, you find that they actually, you know, uh, begin to take charge of their lives, begin to take control of their lives. And so that's how resilience and mental health are related. The um, healthier you are mentally, more confident, the higher the esteem, the higher your self-efficacy, your ability to confront and deal with Deborah, thank you. I just, I want to just ask you some, just two questions here. We've had a question, as I said, from a, a viewer from Harare. Thank you for your question. Um, the, the issue is about stigma and looking at it from an African context, in the context that uh, in villages or in rural areas or even in town, it's a stigma um, if if it's mental illness, but they don't see it as that way. They may call it witchcraft or bewitching or something like that. That's a question from one of our viewers. Thank you very much for that. And my question, of course, is that if someone suffers from something like depression and anxiety, I mean, it, it's not something you can sometimes dig yourself out of, is it? You, you, you need the help. So what type of help you know, in a Zimbabwean environment which you work in can people get to deal with depression and anxiety? So that's a two-part question. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. Yes, there is a stigma in the youth. Um, there's a lot of stigma concerning mental health, but that's not only in Zimbabwe. I guess it's, um, it's, it's, it's global because mostly it's got to do with how people don't understand how a person becomes, how a person has mental health problems. And I noticed that um, when you say mental health, people think of, uh, when you say mental illness, people think of the person who has spent months without bathing, with dirty clothes, picking food from the bin. But no, mental health problems can actually come in the form of a highly functional person who has had traumatic losses and is depressed at that time. So if um, people were aware of what mental health, mental health and mental illness is and what causes it, there would be less and less stigma. I'm really uh, excited uh, about the work that um, is, is, is happening uh, on this platform and what um, they were sharing earlier, uh, because that illness sort of liberates people. It makes you free knowing what mental health is about and also knowing that actually dignified. It can happen to anyone, 
if there is no need for that stigma. An issue of the help that people require in terms of depression is that, I mean, like, even if you look at it, like Zimbabwe, let's take Zimbabwe, we're here in Zimbabwe, what help, what assistance can people get? What, what do they do if they feel that they may be suffering from something, mm -hmm. uh, some mental health uh, issue? Um, I must say we've seen a lot of improvement in terms of people's um, thoughts around mental health. So actually people, you can actually see people walking in, referring themselves, self-referrals, explaining what that they are going through in a patch. So, um, and in Zimbabwe, we've got one of their, one of, um, in a, one of their most amazing research, but med community mental health program, the French bench, where we have lay people um, going through simple problem solving techniques, uh, helping people to solve problems. And it's been shown to have tremendous results in terms of alleviating depression, common mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders. But in Zimbabwe, what ideally what should happen is that people should get professional help. Um, we have more and more counselors being trained now, um, and but unfortunately we do not have infrastructure, we do not have enough human resources, resources to deal with mental health issues. Thanks, Deborah. If I could just step in there quickly um, from some of our mental health awareness days that then evolved. For every one of Deborah's, when I was first looking at this not too long ago, there were a million Zimbabweans. So if I just pause on that statistic, it is quite staggering. Obviously, it is improving, but going back to the, um, the needs, the requirements, and the reality on the ground that we were discovering in the mental health awareness, that journey of discovery um, also brought in cultural sensitivities, a lot of things that were isolated or suppressed. And it's in discussing the fact that it's okay to not be okay. The fact that within some of these communities you are speaking to, people were coming forward to say, yeah, we do have these issues. We might not know the answers, but how can we get help to find these answers? And the friendship branch is an amazing um, uh, contributor to that. And just to finish off quickly on that note, we went forward and proposed having a wellness festival because a lot of people in Zimbabwe do like to laugh and have a good time. So it's not all about mental ill health and it's about bringing people together. So we put a day together at the showgrounds where we did some fitness in the morning. We had some government, non-government and private sector assistance. We had people talking about these very issues and how to find help and where to find help. And in the evening, we had a group of top artists from Zimbabwe all pooling together to help us. And the strap line for that was strive to survive Shinga Urirami. And we were expecting 500 to 1,000 people on one of the coldest days of last year. 15,000 people turned up. Oh. So the appetite is there, the need and the requirement for assistance and help is there, and we've got to take these small steps towards it. So that's why we're so grateful to Deborah, Worldmaker, and others, and particularly you guys for helping us carry the message. And I think, Ed, this conversation is exactly what we're doing out there. I, I think uh, I want to cross over to David for a question, but I think, David, did you hear that statistic? Uh, roughly 14 clinical psychologists for 14 million people. That's incredible. David? Absolutely. No, it's a significant challenge. And my, my question was going to be, and I suspect it's just been answered, but you know, if, um, if clinical psychologists and, and experts are, are the challenge, are one of the challenges, you know, uh, is that the biggest challenge to building resilience in communities in Zimbabwe? Um, uh, uh, or are there others? Um, I think that's maybe first ask Ed and then uh, ask Deborah for her so professional insight on it. Thanks, David. I think I would bow directly to Deborah on that. But in my experience, limited experience and exposure that I've had, if we take it to the community level and if we engage with the community, a lot of communities are saying we are able to do this, we would like to do this, and maybe some structures, guidance and advice. But it's not, going right back to one of the earlier comments about people coming from outside a community, outside a country and imposing a will or suggesting a way forward, instead of doing what Jeff said is turn up and listen first and then with collective experience and guidance and help, see where we can then leave that community with those tools that, that Molly was talking about. But I would have to bow to, to Deborah for a response on this one. Okay, so the question is, what, some, what are some of the obstacles in getting mental health into the community. Um, so basically, we want to start looking at the community's knowledge of what mental health or mental illness is. 
So we find that in our communities there are two main um, approaches. So there is the traditional or cultural beliefs on what causes mental illness. So some people believe that it's caused by um, a vengeful spirit, um, by evil spirit, or that you've been bewitched. So you find that when we come with our our biological social model, it may not quite fit what the community is expecting, and they are not actually thinking that their problems can be solved by a clinical psychologist, for example. We also have the other arm, who are our spiritual or religious leaders, who believe that whatever is happening is either a curse or they are demons that need to be cast out, um, or that um, is a punishment from God. So we find that um, these two approaches offer a, a, a quick, um, seemingly quick solution. And usually, I, I also feel that people like that because then it, it, it sort of removes responsibility from themselves. They don't have to, they don't have to be developing resilience, they don't have to be dealing with it because they are not in control, it's spiritual or it's culture. So those are some of the huge, huge barriers, but I, I believe the appetite is there. I believe people are getting more and more enlightened, enlightened and there's a lot of work that we can do to help the community appreciate and make sure that people get appropriate help where they're supposed to get. David? Yeah, um, uh, that, that's great. Thank you, Deborah. I mean, I, I'm just sort of reflecting back on one of the things Molly talked about where she talked about the four, four pillars of, of well-being, your safety, belonging, competence, and purpose. And how if you, if you don't have those pillars in place, the opposite is to feel threatened, isolated, powerless, and useless. And it, it strikes me that there's a, a very close relationship between those feelings, those pillars, or the absence of those pillars and, mental, and, and your mental health. Uh, Deborah, do you want to offer any thoughts on that? Um, let me get the second part of the question again. Yeah, so, so if, the, if, if the, the pillars, the four pillars of well-being are, are absent, you, will be, you would be threatened, you'd feel threatened, feel isolated, feel powerless, and feel useless. And it strikes me that, that, that those um, pillars are very closely related to your mental health. Uh, and I wonder what your, your thoughts are on that in your role as a, as a psychologist and how, the relation, how close the relationship is between your, your personal and human resilience and your mental health. Okay, usually, uh, when we see that a person is emotionally or behavioral or even um, that they are not thinking well, uh, it's, 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 it's usually a, a sign of something that's not going well, uh, a cry for help. So maybe their safety is threatened, uh, maybe they, their sense of belonging has been threatened, or they, they, they feel that um, they are not competent, or they feel that they, they have lost their sense of purpose. They feel useless, they feel um, yes, they, they have no meaning in terms of um, in terms of their lives. So what what we can what we see is that all behaviors, uh, especially when they are out of the norm, are a cry for help. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that, Deborah. Deborah yeah. You know, one thing that came through particularly, in fact, all the panelists, Jeff, Molly, um, you know, mentioned this, is about, about support structures and how critical it is support structures. And it doesn't have to be just family. It could also be community driven. I mean, how, how, how can that make, make mental health easier, if I, can, if I can call it that, or at least manageable? And how can we get more people, support structures involved around people that have mental health so that they get the, the necessary help or assistance they need? Okay, um, I would like to take a look at what our cultural, uh, what our cultural practices are in terms of how we, we, we support each other. While uh, there is a lot of talk about Ubuntu, I find that um, you, uh, there is little personal support for the individual, for, for individual goals to build resilience. Uh, um, Earlier, uh, the Minister of Sports, Kathy Coventry, spoke about how her family was the biggest fan. 
what we find that in the what we find in the society is, is that in some cases your supposedly support structure may actually be your worst enemy. We have people calling others names, um, saying many things, you never amount to anything. Um, so you know, the, we, we actually have certain relatives in our culture who are free to say the meanest thing to anyone. So they might laugh at you and call you Pinocchio because they are those close family members, family members who are allowed to say negative stuff about people. So they can laugh at the size of your nose, they can laugh at uh, how you look and they can call you names. Um, and I often find that um, most, of people, most of the people in my culture are very stingy with giving out compliments, with giving out uh, positive feedback because they say that a person will become big-headed. But they are very quick and very eloquent in telling you of the negative things. So culturally, we could start from there to learn to build individual resilience. I think that's a good comment. I think people need to get together about mental illness. As you said, Deborah, it, it shouldn't be a stigma. It mustn't be a stigma. And I think Ed said it nicely, and maybe Ed can come in there. The fact is that people talking about it, people acknowledging it, understanding what it is, understanding the various paths to, 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 get, it, to get help for it. I think, I think that, that's a good step, isn't it, Ed? Quite right, Ali. I think the ripple effect and what we've seen in, in what is a very small global village that we're in now because of the communication that we have, and David mentioned it, never have we been so technically connected and yet potentially more separated. So when we see the discussions that are going on around the world, and I'm not just talking in England and the US, we're talking all over the world, that ripple effect that we are able to learn from, draw on, invite to maybe um, learn from uh, and then adapt to uh, what is culturally significant here and being sensitive to those um, those uh, cultural realities without without imposing on them. Yeah, and I think uh, we, we, go, we are going to be go, going for a breather shortly, but after the breather, we are having a question and answer session on resilience uh, with both Molly Marty and Deba Machando. And again, um, it's interesting to, 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 to just throw a question out there for them to think about, which I will ask after the breather. Most people, I think, perceive that it's something that you need to be born with. Um, and, you know, you're born with mental health and, and sometimes that may be true in certain instances, but I think sometimes it can, be, it can come up uh, based on circumstances that you're in. Uh, we can look at economic circumstances in Zimbabwe, we can even look at disaster problems. And if you look at COVID-19, for example, possibly people that have lost employment, have lost work, they can suddenly get anxiety, they can suddenly get depressed, and all of these other symptoms um, which may be defined as mental health. So I think that concept or, or, or belief that people may be born with this and it's part of them, could be partly true and it may not be true. And I think that's one of the questions that we will be asking uh, Deborah after the breather when we have our question and answer session. But as I said, uh, it's probably time for us to take a breather. Uh, this broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network, ZTN, and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services, PVO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. This, this broadcast is streaming live on Zim Papers Facebook page, at Zim Papers TV Network on Facebook. So please keep your questions coming in. We have managed to grab a couple of questions from you to ask our panelists. We want to hear from you. After the breather, we'll have a question and answer session on resilience. Don't go away. We will be right back. that as much as possible we can ask them these questions. Now we're getting into our section now where we have a question and answer section now on, on resilience and uh, we'd like to also uh, bring back Molly Marty. She, she did a presentation on Thrive earlier and of course Deborah Machando. Um, but I think what I'd like to do now actually is uh, we had Jeff Buchanan was, was one of our first speakers and I'd just like to see Jeff, um, do you have any comments or questions about the mental health issue or even any experiences that you may have had in working with different people in different areas? Is Jeff there? Oh. Okay, David, I think we'll try and get Jeff. I'm not sure where he is, but uh, David, do you have any initial question to start the quick Q&A, please? Yeah, of course. Um, Molly, what, we, we started talking about the, the, 
the tools for strengthening the four pillars of well-being. What, what, what sort of tips would you have for uh, people living out in Zimbabwe who would just like to start growing their own resilience? What can they do to help themselves? Um, I'm muting myself. Yes, uh, David, I, I've really been enjoying this conversation and I'm just going to want to reiterate the points about about stigma and I am looking forward to Jeff's um, input as well because we've learned a lot uh, working with military in, in various countries. There's a very high stigma around mental illness and, and getting help. Um, and we have found, um, and we've seen them in more and more communities, that they're making a distinction between brain health and uh, mental illness or, or mental health. And um, so I know we're going to delve into that question uh, with Deborah. You know, are you born with it? Um, and, and what you pointed out, David, is when these core needs are violated, you know, can that move mental uh, health around? And, and the answer is certainly yes. Um, but the, the broader part in this community, aspect I think is, is what we call Thrive Champions, but it's almost this process of um, educating people and, and deputizing them as, as Thrive Champions so that they're engaged in taking care of themselves and building mm -hmm. others. And um, I think that that's the, the process. As far as what individuals can do, uh, that's kind of the Thrive Five piece of our model. And those five factors are um, begins with self-care. And a lot of times, um, and it can be culturally as well, but even in cultures that give a lot of lip service to self-care, it is left out or it's, it's kind of put at the end to say, okay, and, and there's this thing called professional self-care and it's important, you need to do it. And we prioritize it, we start with it because we know that if you aren't filling up your own pitcher, you can't pour uh, into another's and, and it, you simply cannot give away what you do not have. So we do a lot. Uh, around that and uh, self-care isn't self-indulgence. It isn't, uh, as we say here, a spa day. It's really looking at your core needs and how are those being met as well as your physiological and physical needs, um, the sleep, the nutrition, the hydration. Um, and all of this uh, needs to be built in that context of how about people that aren't resourced in those ways? How about food scarcity? How about poverty? Um, and all of those discussions kind of go into that, that um, piece of self-care. And then we move to self-awareness. Um, and, and Deborah mentioned this, that um, it's only when you're aware of your thoughts and your feelings and uh, sensations and what's going on around you that you can even begin to really engage in that active uh, mental wellness path and a path of resilience. Uh, the next piece is emotional regulation, um, regulating your emotions and staying within that um, kind of window a tolerance so that you're not reacting or you're not making things worse for other people um, and you're coming from a place of, of calm and being able to listen right back to where we started about a key aspect of leadership. And then we get to coping skills. This is often where people want to start. They want to start with, okay, give me the things that I can do to make it better or to adapt. It, it's an important conversation. There's a lot that we can do, um, but it's built on that foundation of, of self-care, and self-awareness and emotional regulation. And then we get to social and relationship skills. That's the fifth piece. Um, and how do we interact and uh, learn from and support each other? And um, in the States and in some other areas, you know, we do a lot with um, bullying prevention and, um, and social dynamics, conflict resolution. Those are the type of things that fall under uh, social and relationship skills, uh, learning empathy, uh, showing compassion, Compassion for self must come before compassion for others. I like that. Compassion for self must come before compassion for others. Thank uh, Molly. Um, I, I want to now ask the question that I had uh, intimated before the breather. Um, that was about this, I suppose, possible misconception, Deborah, that uh, so, I mean, some mental mental illnesses you can be born with. Uh, I think issues like bipolar, I think, comes to mind. Uh, I'm not an expert in it, but others can actually come due to situational issues, uh, e economic issues, uh, poverty, uh, disasters, and so forth. Maybe a comment on that. So it's true that um, there are some predisposing factors that can cause a person to become mentally unwell. So the same way that we have um, genetic problems and you find that um, the, 
certain people. So, so we are looking at maybe dysfunction structural uh, problems or even functional problems. The, like um, I like to talk about eyesight. You find that there are some people who have got short eyesight or um, long, they, so they might have long sight or short sight because of the, the thickness of their lens in their eyes. Same applies to the brain. If there is a bruise on the brain, maybe due to a road traffic accident, if there is um, some genetic problems, yes, uh, a person can be predisposed to, uh, to mental illness, even chemical imbalances, because our emotions, our behaviors are controlled by hormones, neurotransmitters, and anything can go wrong uh, in the body, the same way that other, uh, things, other body functions, body parts go wrong. But there is also a lot of it that is environmental, uh, and that a lot of it can be in control of it, like the negative life environment, that life, life situation that you spoke about. That's excellent. Um, okay, uh, David, I think you had a question for Molly. Yeah, Molly, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times over the course of this afternoon you, that the Thrive model is a, is a strengths-based model. Um, do you want to sort of unpack what you mean by that and just explain it a little more? Certainly. Yeah, the Thrive model, I would say that the things that characterize it, it's evidence-informed, um, it's research-based. I think that's really important and that makes it very dynamic because we stay on top of that research and we learn more. And it's strength-based, uh, kind of going back to that parable of two travelers and, and what we focus on expands. How can we possibly grow strength and resilience if we're focused on assets and deficits? Um, and um, absolutely mental illness and meeting needs um, is a central part of resilience building. Um, but when we focus on the assets and the strengths, um, it, it unleashes more energy. It, it creates some positive forward movement and we can use those resources and that energy to start mending and fixing and, and moving forward. Ed's story on, on thinking they'd have, you know, a thousand, couple thousand show up and 15,000 uh, people showed up. It, it, uh, it, it speaks to this, right? They, they show up, they, they want answers. And um, I believe they're showing up not just for themselves, but for community and each other. And, and when we do that and start to um, understand the power um, that we have within ourselves and within our communities, and this is such an essential piece for an organization like World Maker, even though we're global, we're still, um, you know, people in, in large part of, of membership coming maybe from the US or the UK or outside to any culture. And we have to start by listening. But one piece I really want uh, for us to do as a strength-based model is really hold up a mirror. Um, we stand with that mirror back to that community um, to say that we see the, the goodness and we see the, the brilliance and the possibility within. And, and yes, every community has its challenges. Certainly um, we're at various starting points, but we can start where we are. We can meet each other where we are and we can grow from there. And that's what it means to be strength or asset-based. Great, thanks for that. I think uh, we, we will have a chance to ask all our panelists more questions uh, coming up at about uh, just after half past four, because we will have a, a full panel discussion after that. Um, but I think I would like now to introduce the Action Aid representative, Nyaradzai Gumbozvanda. She is the International Board Chair for Action Aid. And just to give you a bit of background on who they are, and I'm sure she'll fill you in more, Action Aid is an international non governmental organization whose primary aim is to work against poverty and injustice worldwide. So I'd just like to uh, invite Nyara Zai to uh, give us a, uh, a brief discussion and, 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 and about who she is in Action Aid and also the impact on wellness, on mental health and so forth. So Nyara Zai, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate that as Action Aid, we are able to be a collaborative partner on this very, very important platform. And I want to thank you all for inviting us. Um, I am calling from Umfurudzi, which is um, here in Shamba district. It's a rural community. And therefore, I'll also speak from the perspective of a, a Zimbabwean woman who lives in uh, rural communities fighting poverty 
and, uh, and injustice um, for which Action Aid is very clear that um, our mandate is around supporting and working with people uh, in poverty and excluded in order to drive change, but also clearly that uh, we must continue to recognize that uh, poverty is embedded in injustice. And within that already, we can feel the issues around the trauma that surrounds the reality of, um, of living in, um, in poverty. Um, as, a, as an organization, um, I am a human rights lawyer. I work with girls and young women all my life mostly, and also serve as the African Union Goodwill Ambassador on Ending Child Marriage. So towards the end, I'll talk about mental health and child marriage and connect with Deborah's conversation much more specifically. Just to come back to the issues around uh, resilience, for action aid with a high level of self-awareness, a self-awareness around how we need to locate the conversation on resilience when we work on poverty from an understanding that these are issues around rights and dignity. This is about individual citizens who are entitled to live a life um, of dignity, entitled to certain rights, basic rights, could be education, health, food security, but also a very clear understanding around how it's critical to, to, to address the issues of resilience with an understanding of redistribution. That uh, at the end of it, it's uh, the trauma, the stress factors, the, what is causing some of the tensions that we have are inequalities. And therefore, in, very deep in our awareness is the need for uh, issues around redistribution, whether it's redistributing power, resources, knowledge, opportunities. It's, it's very critical uh, within our perspective. And coming to resilience specific, our, our overall approach and is the three areas that I've talked about, the rights, the redistribution, but definitely resilience. And on resilience, uh, Action Aid is very clear that we need to, to look into the issue of capacities that Molly, you talked about. Um, and the need to center the absorptive capabilities and capacities is important. The issues around adaptive, uh, what is the adaptive capacities within our communities, but also, if we just have absorptive and adaptive without transformation, it means we are expecting individuals and communities to have a perpetual capacity to absorb injustice. So we are also very clear that we need a transformative dimension to resilience. Uh, we know in our Shona culture, there's a word like kushingirira. When you are in a domestic violence case, we initially we thought you know you can you can you can be resilient you can you can stand the heat you can sit in there and we are saying that's not the resilience that we are looking at where you can tolerate injustice in perpetuity but we need a resilience approach that enables us to be transformative and i'm very excited that uh, in our model of resilience it's an ecosystem we see this as an ecosystem and a web of interconnectedness, of skills, of knowledge, of networks, and of innovating together. And we have an exciting work that has been happening in Zimbabwe, of that ecosystem with the um, Zimbabwe Resilience uh, Building Fund, uh, which is really bringing a range of partners from donors, communities, private sector. And to say we need resilience, not only in terms of the individual, but resilience of society, of communities, and us, identifying the Zambezi Valley, that community which has been affected uh, and uh, which has food insecurity, cannot do sufficient um, uh, crop agriculture. And we have to really say, what are the resources within this community which we need to build and work with? And for us, livestock was a very exciting uh, entry point. And therefore say, how do we build together with communities, approaches which enable the communities to get out of poverty, to innovate, to adapt, but also to demand a transformation. And we can share more information on the chat around that work uh, that we are doing, which is linking the climate change uh, related dimensions, the private sector and the individual households. Because we know that when we have to address poverty and personal pressure at the household level, we have to transform the economy 
at household level. Household poverty linked with the macro environment is very important uh, for us in the work we do. The second, which is a very important piece of work for, for us and which is the reality, is this moment in, with COVID-19. What is, how, how, how can we talk about resilience in a context of uh, the reality with COVID-19, the brokenness of the healthcare system, the transfer of care work to the household, to the community. So when we talk about resilience, in a context where COVID is coming, when we have the economic crisis, we have HIV, we have high HIV prevalence still in this country in a context where some communities like uh, in the Eastern Highlands in uh, Chimani Mani are still trying to recover from Cyclone Idai. So for us, the conversation around resilience should not be a mononarrative, a mononarrative of a single stress factor, but he has to look into the confluence of factors and say, yes, as we respond to the structural issues and we do disaster preparedness, we also need to deal with the trauma and enable communities to be able to access the services that we need. So for us, that resilience approach is not, requires multiple layers of intervention. And we are saying within COVID-19 and the response in COVID-19, part of the resilience of communities should not be about task shifting, but should be about investing in public services by the government. Communities can only hold so much the government has a primary responsibility to provide services, healthcare, education, justice, social welfare, because a household and the community can only do so much. So for us, that advocacy is important, but at the same time, the connection between the international actors and community social networks is very important. So Action Aid has been really building capabilities, working with community groups and networks, for them to be able either to do the prevention work, the social um, protection related interventions, but also to address the critical and invisible issues of gender-based violence. And for us, strengthening the referral pathways, toll-free numbers, counseling, women's networks, is part of building resilience for communities because you need an ecosystem of response, but an ecosystem providing direct contact with individual, but also which is transformative within itself. And we are still, we still need to say, how do we deal with the trauma to the level of trauma of a nation and multiple traumas which are my reflection I want to have with you is around my work on ending child marriage. Every day I run Rosaria Memorial Trust is my day job. And uh, with uh, also serving as the AU ambassador on ending child marriage. What we are calling marriage is rape. So at times when we deal with mental health, we, we mischaracterize the issue. By mischaracterizing rape of our girls and calling it a marriage, we are sanitizing and normalizing a traumatic experience. And to imagine a 14 year old whom we are saying is married when actually she's raped, she finds herself pregnant, unplanned, unwanted pregnancy, and positive, at times she's HIV positive. So the multiple traumas have also started to say, when our primary, our prevention and mental health uh, approaches in public health are not resourced. You have heard with, from my sister Deborah, there is very limited resources to public health, especially related to mental health. It means we need to innovate, including innovation uh, within culture and saying we need a transformative approach that would remove the stress factors, but also build new spaces, reclaim new spaces for healing. So I'm working closely with the University College of London to look at our Nanga safe spaces, working with Madziba Teachers College, um, working with SI 360 to say, let's reclaim the traditional cultural innovations that existed and rebuild those because it's not enough to say you go to a clinic when the clinic is overwhelmed. We need to find and innovate within the space that we have for healing, for support, but as part of the referral system. So in conclusion, 
we are looking at resilience, both in my everyday work, but also in the work that we do within Action Aid to say the individual is as important as the collective. Building systems for resilience and healing, they have to be systems which also heal communities and not just heal the individual. And they have to be part of the transformative agenda of governance, of economics, to make sure that we remove the stress factors that are creating the pressures and the trauma that we experience within our communities. Thank you very much and over to you, David. No, Zai, thank you for that. That was uh, thought provoking and uh, you know, excellent to be honest. Uh, I, I just wanted to just uh, maybe for you to seek a little bit of clarification around some issues. Um, you know, you mentioned that there's a, there's a linkage between economic impact, household poverty, and you called it, and also possibly the linkage between um, public services, uh, the, the ability for government to provide public services uh, that, that can alleviate some of this. But, and, I, and I also wanted to comment on this transformative approach. I think you mentioned it many times. What, what specifically would you be recommending um, in terms of actions that can be taken to, to make transformative approaches, uh, uh, you know, a reality. What, what, what needs to be done? Thank you. So on the first question around the, the household, let's be, let's talk about yesterday. We were getting reports of um, mothers going to the referral hospitals or to the hospitals and being unable to be assisted and therefore losing their babies during delivery. That woman is, tra is traumatized. And that is a public service health issue. It's not a about making sure that the services are available. And at the same time, that woman, there is also a woman who may not even have afforded with this lockdown to get a bus or a scotch cart to go to the nearest health center. So it also means that woman, the household capability, the poverty at household level impacts the capability to access the service, but accessing the service is premised on the availability of that service. So we need to look at that chain in a clear way so that when we are talking about resilience, it's not just about that individual woman with a maternal health situation in her household, but is that community being able to respond and support each other together, but at the same time, it's also about our public institutions and our governments investing in healthcare services. So that's the continuum that we'll be looking at, because if we do not look at the continuum, it means our resilience approach is not sustainable in itself because a person can have internal capabilities, but if the ecosystem, the environment around that individual continues to reproduce the trauma, then the healing does not go away because you continue to be traumatized. My mother was married when she was 13 years. I'm a 14th pregnancy. I know what she went through as an experience of child marriage. The other question that you have, Andy, is around how do we do transformation? What we are seeing with our work in the Zambezi Valley is that when households are doing livestock production, we have to go beyond subsistence agriculture for people in rural areas and look at the value chain of going to the market. And therefore, the partnership with the private sector to say, yes, you may be keeping your five goats, your cattle, your cows, but it's not about just selling to the neighbor. It's not about just being able to have an ox drawn <laughs> plow. It's actually about being able to transform that community, that household, to be able to be part of an ecosystem of an economy. So for us, resilience, building resilience and fighting poverty is a system that would enable us to both address the individual, the collective, and the framework, the environment, the policy environment is where leadership lies. So leadership is both at the household and community level, but it's also a policy environment that enables people to innovate and for us to scale up innovations in communities, which is enabling them to heal, 
and they're breathing. Uh, yeah, I was like, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to pop in there, but we have to take a breather. But please keep your thoughts because uh, you will be on the panel after the breather. So um, we need you to continue here because you're, it's very interesting. Um, okay. After the we are going to have a panel discussion with all the panelists, and we also will be in will be having on that Justin Bungoni, who is the executive director, chief executive officer of the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Um, you're participating in the Zimbabwe Virtual Resilience Symposium, developing human resilience in society: the role of leaders in crafting the right environment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network ZTN and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services PVO, Action Aid and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. As I said, after the breather, we'll have all our panelists to have our final panel discussion. Don't go away. We will be right back. Zimbabwe, Africa, so we're really getting a, a good feel of some of the issues on leadership, resilience, and mental health. So please, your questions, you have half an hour left. Our show finishes at five o'clock. So please keep your questions coming in if you have any so we can ask our panelists. Now it's this time that we actually now bring all our panelists together. And I know that we've had Jeff Buchanan. He was our first speaker at about quarter past two. Um, so we'll bring him back as well as Molly, Deborah, and of course, Nyara Zai, who we've just heard from. And David, of course, is, is there in London. We will also be joined by Justin Bungoni. We're hoping to get him on the line. We're still trying to get him. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Um, and hopefully, we'll, he'll come in to look at the economic aspects of mental health and the impact it's had on the economy. But I think uh, now let's open up our panel discussion. I'd like to go across to David. Uh, David, maybe you can, um, you can ask the first question. Yeah, Je Jeff, um, one for you. I, I, I recall you know, one of the things you've often said about leadership is, is the importance of knowing yourself as a leader. And, and I, I heard you describe once, um, to illustrate that, using a medical analogy, which I thought really resonated and made total sense. I, I, I wonder if you could just talk us through that and tell us a little bit more about what you really mean by knowing yourself as a leader. Sure, you know, uh, Sun Tzu was an ancient Chinese philosopher and he had one of his uh, one of his famous sayings was that the the commander who knows himself and knows his enemy will be victorious in a hundred battles, and so I I think that you know that that applies to knowing yourself, your organization in this case military strengths and weaknesses of your your force, but also knowing yourself as an individual I think is really really important. But the key insight for me is that especially as you move up the chain and you become a leader of larger and larger organizations is that knowing yourself is critical, but it's not an, it's good, but it's not good enough. You actually have to share that knowledge with others so that they can help mitigate your, your weaknesses and reinforce your strengths. And to your question about the medical analogy, uh, this goes back to one of my previous experiences. I was working for a guy who was a wonderful commander. We were deployed overseas, and he was working for a guy that was a wonderful commander. But the two of them were at odds. And there was a lot of friction between these two organizations. And, and so one day I asked, you know, my boss, my friend, I asked him what was going on. And he said, well, the, the issue is we have a conflict in decision-making styles. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, let me, let me share with you this medical analogy. He said, some people are, are very comfortable making decisions with just a little bit of information. Think of this person as an emergency room doctor. You know, they're, they're used to dealing with trauma, very little information, and they have to begin to stabilize the patient and get to work right away on uh, trying to save somebody's life. He says... The next group of people are what we call surgeons. And, uh, and surgeons, surgeons want a lot more information. You know, they need nine, instead of 50 or 60% of the information before they make a decision, they want 90% of the information. They almost always make great decisions, go back to the emergency room doctor. The emergency room doctors sometimes make mistakes because they're trying to act so quickly. They don't have all the information. The surgeon needs more information, but the problem is the patient's got to get really sick before he sees the surgeon. And he said, now the last group of people, they always operate with complete information, 100% of the information, and they always 
make the completely right decisions. The problem is we call those people pathologists. And so I looked at them and I said, oh, you mean, so it's, so you're obviously an emergency room doctor. It's better to be an emergency room doctor than a surgeon or a pathologist. And he said, no, no, you're, that's too simple. The issue is that every style has its inherent strengths and weaknesses. If I'm an emergency room doctor, I need to share that information with my subordinates and make sure that they understand that I'm gonna decide in a hurry. And if you wanna bring something to me that even looks like you want a decision, you're gonna get one. But, but I also need to empower them to come back with, come back to me with more information. If, if we learn down the road that we went left and we should have gone right, I need to empower them and in fact insist that they come back with that more information so that we can correct the course that we're on. And conversely, if you're a surgeon, I think, it, you know, again, there's inherent strengths with being a surgeon, but if you're a surgeon and when it comes to decision-making style, you need to figure out how are you gonna keep that, that patient healthy while you're waiting for more and more information to make a critical decision. So it's, it's, it's important to know yourself, but you also got to share that with others so that they can help you. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, Molly, I wondered actually if, if having, having heard that I speak so wonderfully previously and talk about the real importance of, of resilience being transformative, if, you'd, if you have any thoughts around uh, transformative resilience. Yes, David, you know me well enough, you know I, I lit up when I heard that um, to my sister from Action Aid. That was brilliant. I already messaged her to say I could listen to you <laughs> for hours. Um, I, this work started as a community resiliency project and, and it's grown. We've experienced that and, and through that um, we have learned very much what, what we're hearing from our colleagues in Zimbabwe. Um, resilience building is a process of reducing risk factors and increasing protective factors. And that's what we're trying to do all the time, reduce those risk factors. So that's why we're talking about mental illness. That's why we're talking about um, uh, poverty and injustice and all of those things that need to be done and then increasing the protective factors. Um, so we're talking about wellness and education and, um, and, it, and it's constant. And so those factors of innovation and transformation run core to the work and um, it's this process, I know Jeff, you started with a, a quote from Maya Angelou and, and it's uh, another quote from the wise woman of uh, when you know better, you do better. And, and it's, it's continuing to reach out our hands and helping people um, understand more so that they do uh, know better and start to do better in their lives and then to help others. Um, so it is a transformative process. And one thing we've really um, learned is that it's a bottom up and top down process. Um, and so it will always be, resilience building will always be bottom up. It happens in community, it happens in relationship, it happens in resourcing to the best of our ability with each other. And yet there are, there are ceilings, there are limits uh, based on the, the structures that we live in and the policies and procedures and, and governments and infrastructures. And so we need that top down. We need that, that leadership, we need that collaboration, we need that resourcing, um, we need that change in policies and structures over time. And, and that's what we found in our community work. And that was part of our progress to grow to a national resilience um, institute where I spent a lot more time in DC and I spent a lot more time um, with national uh, policymakers and, and governmental funders and things like that. And, and then eventually to the global work that we're doing. And so that um, has just kind of been the, the unfolding of what we're talking about today, our, our personal journey. And uh, it, it has been transformative and um, and, and that's true for resilience and individual and um, community and, and I believe a, a societal, a cultural and global level. All right, thank you. Thank you. I, I want to, I've got a question here from uh, one of our audience, uh, Eric Chikanya. I am going to paraphrase Eric because it is quite a long question. I'd, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to direct this to both Nyarad Zai and Deborah. Um, the issue is resilience in young people is premised on, on having hope. I think the context that there's a better or brighter future ahead for, for someone obviously can, 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 can do a lot towards building resilience because they know that you know, it, it's rainy today, but the sunshine will come out. So now it's like, 
how how can how can how can people build hope in in individuals in communities? What what really needs to be done to show people that yes, there is a brighter future ahead, and don't lose hope, so to speak. Um, thank you. Um, my work with young people um, is that the first hope is to be in the individual. We have to affirm the young person as an individual. We have to create uh, opportunities uh, that can unleash their potential because the, the self is so important because if we don't affirm uh, self-esteem, sense that I know something, I can do something, it's not about just book education. It's also about the innate knowledge. My work with young people, especially in rural communities, is that a ability to read and write. It doesn't mean that you are ignorant if you are not able to read and you, you have some knowledge and some wisdom and some skills within you. And so affirming the person is so important as a starting point to unleash the potential. And definitely the young people has to be part of creating that vision of what that that hope looks like. So, and also it's very important to be honest as leaders, to be honest so that young people do not like to continue to be given promises which they don't see movement and action and opportunities. So it's, it's a responsibility of people in leadership. It could be us who are positional leadership of action aid as board chair or leaders in public office as parliamentarians, that we should not create false hope, but you should be able to also offer opportunities that are tangible and doable together with the young people. It's co-creating. We really believe in the co-creation of that future, but we should also understand that young people are not leaders for tomorrow. Because young people are leading today, especially when we look at those who are over 18 years, they are voting, they, are, they have rights, they have responsibility. We have this uh, perception that young people are waiting to be given, they are dependent. I think we need to see that young people are, are the most creatives of the moment. And they are the biggest consumers of the moment when you look at technology, what's happened, all this. So it's to re reframe our analysis of who these young people are. And I think the, the, the onus is not on the young people. The onus is on the older leaders who are not courageous enough to co-create and co-lead with young people. Thank you for that. Um, it's interesting you talked about uh, people saying they're uneducated. And I, I, I remember this uh, famous story that uh, my grandmother told me. She said, I may be uneducated, but if you give me a hundred Zimbabwe dollars and you try and give me bad change, I'll be able to count exactly how much you owe me. So it's quite interesting. But I want to also throw that same question to uh, Deborah in the context of hope. And, and, and does hope have a correlation or, or at least a linkage between mental, mental health in, in the sense that if people feel they have a hope, can that help? With mental health issues? Um, yes, uh, hope definitely helps with mental health issues. Um, so I'd like to, uh, you know, look at the Zimbabwe situation. I know that um, there is so much negativity that goes on, but um, we, uh, we want to reframe that negativity to start looking like, uh, use different lenses to look at this situation. You know how people become immune to certain infections, it's because they get infected and their bodies develop anti antibodies that can fight against that, that, that disease. So if we look at our situation in Zimbabwe, it's actually a, 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 an environment that is building people to be able to tackle even greater situations. So um, one way of looking at it is to put things into perspective. Of course, there is poverty, of course, the economy is bad, of course, there, there are these things that are bad, but is it, uh, do we have problems 24 7, uh, seven days of the week, uh, like 365 days? No, there are. Uh, so, this program, for example, is one small initiative to help people build initiatives. 
So there are positive things happening in Zimbabwe. And if we take charge of our lives, we can make a difference. Um, while people are crying, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of this story where uh, people look, looked at Africa in, in terms of a, a, a business prospect. Uh, and someone says, ah, there's no market in Africa for shoes because people don't wear shoes. But the other person looked at Africa and said, my God, there's so much opportunity because there are no shoes in Africa, so there's a huge market. So that's how I like to look at situations. There is so much potential, even from the negative environment. There is lots of hope. We can make it. That's great. David? Great, yeah, thank you. I've, I've, I've just based on what Niyad Zaid has just said, I've got one for Molly and then I thought I'd, I'd turn to, to Jeff as well. Niyad Zaid said, you know, affirming the person is so important um, and, and giving people self-belief, affirming who they are. And, and, I, and I wondered, Molly, if you could talk about how that plays into some of the, of the four pillars of well-being uh, or actually the four, five, six model in general. Yeah, a lot of, of what was said on hope, um, and hope sits within the V of the, the T-H-R-I-V-E, the vision piece, and, and actively co-creating that future. So we, um, we've experienced also where societies, um, American included, tend to park young people on the sidelines and just wait kind of for a magic day that they become smarter or um, are entitled or have, have figured out where they can step in um, to being contributing members. And um, we're seeing that shift slowly, but I, I think that's um, a dynamic that really needs to be addressed actively. Um, we see hope as, as kind of a, a few-step process of, of first just um, seeing that there is a path from A to B. There is a path that can lead to a better uh, future, a better day, a brighter day, just that it exists. Um, because a lot of people don't even have that um, ability to, to hold that possibility. Um, as Deborah just talked about that possibility. And then that next step is to um, see that as an individual, I can take a first step forward. And, and so often we need other people to support us in that. Um, you know, where can you start? Baby steps count. Um, what might this look like? And then and the research shows the third is, is motivation and, and we shift that to support. Um, that not so much that internal motivation, but that we're supported to take that step. And then we work on that. Um, inner strength to continue walking and being supported forward. Um, so this conversation runs all the way through um, the Thrive uh, 456, meeting our core human needs and, and building up those pillars, uh, working on that individual uh, process of, of caring for ourselves and building that awareness and, um, and, and growing that strength uh, to have more skills so that we can continue to walk forward a step by step because the key is you take that first step and you have a whole new perspective or venue. And um, absolutely, that can be constrained by our environment and, and um, that particular circumstance. Um, but that, that stepping out process creates just that little more uh, light to come in, a perspective where you can keep walking that out. Um, and I guess the final thing I want to say, just listening to this conversation and, and um, hearing what's coming up is, you know, these are big issues. Um, and, and I had that experience many, many times when I started at work where I could pretty quickly uh, see people that would go, okay, yeah, that, that matters and it sounds important, but that's huge. Like, how do you even begin this work of resilience? And it is big and it's not for the faint hearted. And so I'm just so grateful for all the courageous people that are stepping up uh, into this conversation and, and around this table today and to move this work forward. Um, it, it, it is big work, it's, it's human work and it's about human dignity. And, um, and for all of you that have so actively participated and shared your brilliance today and given people hope um, in ways that you likely will never understand fully. Um, I, I'm just very, very grateful. Molly, thank you. Uh, Jeff, just a quick one for you in, in a minute or so is, is um, the outside mentioned courageous leaders and, and being courageous enough to take, a, to take a risk. What are your sort of reflections on courageous leaders and and the role they can play in, 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 in environments like this. Sure, uh, thanks David. So, you know, Molly just talked about, about hope and that's really about what's going on within the individual and getting young people, for example, involved in helping to establish uh, a vision can give them hope. But it's also a powerful impact on the entire organization. 
And this is really what diversity is all about. Instead of surrounding yourself as a leader with people who, who think exactly like you, you know, when you can bring in people to the organization that have a different perspective, men and women, people from different national origins, importantly, age, if you can bring young people and old people in together to help establish a vision and give alternate voices, uh, I think it's better. It's better for the individuals, but it's also better for the entire organization. And, and so courage is really about acting with a heart. You know, the root for the word courage is cour, which comes from the French. And, and so when you act with your full heart, you can, you can do right for the people you're serving as well as the entire organization. Jeff, that's brilliant, thank you. Uh, and finally, Ed, just uh, a final question before we have to move on. Yeah, these are really complex issues um, and um, they're traditionally very personal and usually kept quite isolated and, and, and arguably suppressed as, as Nadze has, has, has alluded to this, after, this afternoon. From your perspective, have you, as you've worked in this area, have you found a willingness in Zimbabwe to really engage with this? Thanks, uh, David. And thanks to everyone for, for what's been a, a fascinating afternoon. I'll, I'll keep it short without diminishing or reducing the seriousness and scale of the, uh, the problems that are being faced in Zimbabwe that are particular and pertinent to Zimbabwe, but not uh, only relating to Zimbabwe, which is why we can call upon help from, from the international community as well. The willingness in Zimbabwe to tackle these issues is very much there in our experience, in our roundtables, in our wellness festival, and in um, the other work that we've been doing within the communities and with partners who are at this table and, and other um, mental health awareness days and events that we've held, uh, there has been a resounding support and willingness to take this further. I anticipate that the coming year with uh, the look forward that I'm sure uh, you'll be concluding with and leading up to the, the, the Resilience Symposium face-to-face -face at Victoria Falls will address a lot of this, but that will still feel like the start point that today feels like, even though we've been at it for a little while. There is much to do and there is great willingness here to do it. Thank you. Right, well, um, you know, it's with sadness, I suppose, that uh, we're coming to the end of, of uh, this uh, program, of course, the Zimbabwe Virtual Resilience Symposium, Developing Human Resilience in Society, the role of leaders in creating the right environment. I must be honest, uh, you know, we started at 2 o'clock and time has literally just flown by. So what I'd like to do now is just uh, go back to David Richmond. He's the Chief Operating Officer at World Maker International, just to really round up and to tell you also about the exciting programs that are coming up that World Maker International will have in Zimbabwe. David, over to you. Andy, thank you. Um, we, we hope that you um, have enjoyed listening to the speakers as much as I know they've enjoyed speaking to you. And, and, I, and I know that actually that final panel, final panel session, we could have gone on for a long, long time because there was so much to talk about. Um, developing our human resilience is going to be critical as we move through the challenges of the coming years. Um, most of which, most of those challenges, I guess, we think we probably already know about, but some we simply won't and we won't be expecting. Um, having leaders at all levels of our society who understand the role they play in supporting communities and individuals to build their resilience and ensuring that we have uh, and are equipped with the education and resources we need to successfully embark on that resilience building journey will be essential to success and we've heard a lot about that this afternoon. Everyone has the right and the strength to thrive through good times and through tough times. And Worldmaker believes wholeheartedly that it is our duty to do everything we can to support people and individuals to, to achieve that. With that in mind in Zimbabwe, we've got four more virtual events planned over the coming months that will focus on uh, natural disasters, uh, particularly Cyclone I dive uh, around the Eastern Highlands, COVID-19 and its impact on the tourism hubs at Vic Falls, uh, the human uh, wildlife conflict ongoing around Kariba, uh, and the challenges of economic resilience in Harare. Uh, details of all of those will be published shortly. Uh, and we plan uh, to host a live summit 
face-to-face summit in 12 months time at Victoria Falls COVID-19 allowing and we'd love you to join us at that too and there will be more details to follow uh, on all of those so please follow um, uh, our information. If you want to know more about what Worldmaker International does and about our work then as I've said a couple of times this afternoon please check out the website on www.worldmakerinternational.org www.worldmakerinternational.org We've really enjoyed our time with you all today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, the discussion and the questions and answers. Uh, and thank you for being active and engaged uh, as an audience. We hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have. Thank you. Please take care. And we will see you all again, I hope, very, very soon. Andy, over to you to conclude. Thank you, David. Well, you know, it's really up to me to uh, bring this to a close. And I'd like to uh, thank our panelists. There's Hon Honorable Kirsty Coventry, Zimbabwe's Minister of Youth, Sports, Arts and Recreation. Uh, Jeff Buchanan, he's a retired United States General. Uh, Dr. Molly Marty, she's the Chief Executive Officer of World Maker International. Deborah Machando, Clinical Psychologist. Ed Holm, he's Chairman of CAS PVO. Uh, Justin Bongoni unfortunately couldn't join us, but I'd like to thank him for at least trying to participate in this discussion. Nyaradzai Gumbodzvanda, International Board Chair for Action Aid, and of course David Richmond, who's the Chief Operating Officer for World Maker International. And of course, a big thank you to you, the ZTN audience who have been watching us since two o'clock this afternoon. Of course, this broadcast is brought to you by Zimpapers TV network, ZTN, and World Maker International. We'd also like to thank our partners, Consolidated Africa Services PVO, Action Aid, and the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, ZRBF. Well, all that's left for me to say is goodbye, have a great afternoon, and you all be safe.